Hello and welcome back to this Dam for the Idealistic Crusade. I am the motion picture analyst and this is my next in the series of James Bond commentaries I've been doing for the official Eon films. This time, of course, we are talking about the 13th in the official series, which is 1983's Octopussy, once again directed by John Glenn and starring Roger Moore pretty much conceived with the same uh, relative same cast and crew as we had seen on For Your Eyes Only and continuing in that film's great success in bringing Bond back down to Earth post Moonraker and sort of inventing a new uh, version of the series for the 1980s that would continue under the uh, steady hand of John Glenn, who would, of course, direct all five Bond films of the 1980s. And also, For Your Eyes Only had set a new precedent in the screenwriting with the partnership of Richard Maybaum with Michael G. Wilson and the focus on pulling any uh, elements of Fleming that had not been used yet as a nice basis to ground the new film story. Uh, primarily with Four Your Eyes Only, they were uh, stuck with using short story elements and a few pieces of some of the novels that hadn't been adapted. So they repeated the same practice here, but with uh, an interesting difference in tone, which I think uh, is primarily due to trying to inject maybe a little more humor uh, to more befit uh, Roger Moore's certain portrayal of Bond, uh, try and uh, make a richer flavor than what we had seen on For Your Eyes Only while keeping to the same general ideas. Uh, and then I think also the other big change-up happened with uh, the first drafts being written by George MacDonald Frazier, who was most famous for his uh, Flashman novels, which I think really gives you the whole notion of why we have the Indian setting and the old-fashioned adventure throughout. But I want to go ahead and mention it now because I think it's it's definitely important to note that, of course, Maybaum and Wilson came in and, and rewrote uh, the McDonald Fraser drafts, but I think that sort of flavor wa was maintained throughout. Uh, the other major influence, and I think the entire reason why they went to Fraser in the first place and why they wanted to have more of a focus on old-fashioned adventure, uh, like any great... Uh, producing entities, if something comes along and is a great success, everybody sort of sits up and takes notice. So, of course, uh, Bond is no stranger to that. Uh, Moonraker in and of itself was produced uh, out of the wake of Star Wars changing the film industry. Well, in 1981, there was another film that came out in the same year as Four Years Only that also was of a similar idea of the, uh, having a sort of going back to basics approach uh, in terms of being a old fashioned action adventure picture uh, about story and character and being serious and grounded and having definite nods to the past. That, of course, being Raiders of the Lost Ark. So I think that Raiders and Indiana Jones has a massive influence on Octopussy, even though no one's really you know, admitted that. I think it's, it's pretty obvious. And, of course, Spielberg was a giant Bond fan, and the whole reason why he got into Indy in the first place was he wanted to direct a Bond, never got the chance to, and you know his, his buddy George, George Lucas, had the Indiana Smith idea in his back pocket and says, I got a great idea. You'll love this. Uh, of course, I would go further. I'll mention it in one or two points. I think Octopussy may have definitely uh, given some inspiration to some of the stuff we see in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, uh, right down to certain sequences are, are very similar. And of course, the Indian setting. So I think it's a, maybe perhaps a case of uh, certain film series sort of influencing each other back and forth. And of course, a great deal of the indie character and world is completely inspired by James Bond without, without question. It's obviously there. And of course, they took this even further in uh, Last Crusade by casting Sean Connery as uh, Jones Sr. and many other uh, various members of Bond casts. And there are many illusions I can make there. But I, I think it's really interesting to note. I think the whole success of, of Raiders and being a throwback to the classic cliffhanger adventure serial of the 1930s and 40s, uh, I think that definitely inspired, at least maybe in the writing process, uh, the, the ideas were already there to maybe add a little bit more of lightness to what we'd seen in Four Your Eyes Only, but to keep along the same lines. So I think that the, the, the Raiders' success coming out of seemingly nowhere and and tying into this this feeling of old-fashioned adventure. I think that sort of seeped into Octopussy and the pre-production stages. And I think it, it's it's a very welcome, uh, welcome thing, but it actually seems to uh, make the interesting part of the plot 
uh, sort of get subdued a bit because most people think of the Indian setting and the, and the, uh, the adventure and old-fashioned elements, but uh, the plot itself is rather interestingly conceived and uh, is very much set up as a mystery, which really hooks the audience as soon as the, the, uh, the main part of the film starts after the title, title song sequence. And uh, it's, it, it, the, the plot elements are doled out over the course of the film very interestingly. So it's, it's also a Bond film that is sort of on its own in that uh, we get pieces of the, of the puzzle, as it were, doled out over the course of the film. We don't meet the title central character until a good ways into the film, and we are once again using the multiple villain setup that we got in For Your Eyes Only, and uh, the plot is extraordinarily convoluted, so much that uh, most people have a hard time figuring out all the intricacies of how the various villain entities are working together and, and how all this plot is supposed to happen in reality. Um, but it's it's kind of fun in that way. You have to sit there and, and th- really think about it. Uh, how does all this work? But it's it's keeping you invested. And there's one point in the film where the entirety of the tone and the actual story takes a complete left turn in a really brilliant reveal that is totally unexpected. So I will uh, cover that when it comes up. So I, I wanted to mention this at the start of this track because I, I always feel I should preface w- some of these tracks that I do with, uh, you know, some keynotes I, I would like to try and cover. And hopefully I do cover because, you know, doing a running commentary is very difficult to try and hit all the things you want to cover and do scene and character analysis as the film is running and obviously not losing your place doing so. So um, every time I finish one of these, I feel like barely scratch the surface. So uh, hopefully you can bear with me and hopefully you find this enjoyable. Octopus is a film that often gets derided uh, simply due to its title, uh, even when the film was about to be released and during its original release, the title was viewed laughingly uh, or in the manner of you can't be serious. Um, but I, I think, you know, it does have one or two elements that maybe are a tad goofy, but I think the everyone in the production was very keen on not, on trying to avoid some of the pitfalls they fell into on Moonraker, where some things went maybe, a, you know, definitely a bit too far. So there are, you know, one or two bits in the film that, you know, I myself and a lot of fans, you know, still sort of not quite cringe at, but you know, there's one or two bits where everybody just sort of has that little bit of a groan, but they're, they're very minimal and they never wreck the film or it's pacing or anything. And in a way they, they've, become sort of endearing because we've come to expect them after watching the film over and over and over again. Uh, The last point I should mention, of course, 1983 was known as the year of the Battle of the Bonds since uh, the long delayed Kevin McClory project dealing with his Bond rights was finally going to be released, which was, of course, the Sean Connery starring Never Say Never Again. And originally, both films were supposed to uh, compete head-to-head at the box office, being released practically within the same week period. Uh, Cubby Broccoli had fought the uh, rival production, uh, you know, with every, you know, tooth and nail and in and out of courts trying to convince them not to do it. Uh, but, you know, ultimately when uh, Jack Schwartzman figured out a, you know, the, the legal rights were there and they went ahead with it, uh, Broccoli was primarily concerned with trying not to release them at the same time because they would wind up, you know, killing each other's box office, which had happened to an extent back in 1967 with the other rival Bond production being uh, Casino Royale. Uh, of course, that film wound up coming out, uh, you know, several months before uh, You Only Live Twice, but uh, it was definitely seen to have played a part in You Only Live Twice having uh, less than the box office returns that had been originally anticipated. So uh, Broccoli really wanted to avoid any sort of scenario like that again. Uh, But luckily, Never Say Never Again had many production uh, difficulties that caused it to be delayed. Um, Not saying that it's good it had production problems, but uh, it was good for both films that it was delayed and that, uh, you know, either both did not, you know, sort of cancel each other out and uh, harm each other's box office. But it was an interesting idea. And of course, the uh, press of the time really ran with the idea of 1983 being the Battle of the Bonds and trying to almost settle the uh, longstanding fan argument of uh, Sean versus Roger, which is, of course, entirely unfair because 
because their portrayals are entirely different, the times at which they portray the character are entirely different, and the films that they made are all entirely different from one another. That's why I think it, it's it's best to look at each actor's individual performances and how they grew as the character over time. So those will be some key points I will try to cover throughout this commentary. And as always, I'm doing these, you know, very much off the cuff in a very conversational manner. And uh, these are merely thoughts that I've accumulated over the years and popped through my head whenever I rewatch the film, uh, intermixed with various production factoids and notes about the film and, uh, you know, things that happened on during the location shooting, various, you know, factors like that. So it is by no means intended to be a, a, a true history of the films. There are many great reference works out there, uh, many great books that belong on every Bond fan's bookshelf. But um, I feel Octopussy is, is definitely one of the most most underrated uh, Bond films without question, and a film that is never looked at very critically for its great strengths. And once again, John Glenn really shows that he was a perfect choice to, uh, you know, t- really take control of the series, even though he is not viewed as a great stylist or a actor's director. I think there is there are really very few films out there. Uh, that show the same level of just intricate craftsmanship. And uh, the Glenn-directed Bond films are so well put together and still show a very innate sense of the editing world and the second unit and how to perfectly integrate first unit, second unit, and to have the editing have a bit of charge because Octopussy is a little bit longer. Uh, It is two hours, ten minutes. It has a more relaxed quality that I think also shows how everyone in the production and John Glenn were uh, much more relaxed, this being the second go-around because of course, once again, uh, John Glenn, this was really only his second directorial effort, his first being For Your Eyes Only, which was an outstanding uh, directorial debut. But um, I, I think you get that nice sense of relaxation, and there's um, an interesting, wonderful, uh, rich quality throughout the film that because everyone is a bit more relaxed, and, and it's sort of a a, a throwback in a sort of way to the classical boy's own style of adventure with the setting, but intermixed with a straightforward uh, Cold War spy story. It's it's a really interestingly crafted film, and it should be looked at seriously and, you know, not just have people snicker at the title, which, of course, is a Fleming original title of the last published uh, volume of his works being uh, the short story collection. So with all that out of the way, uh, go ahead and go to whichever copy of the film you wish to uh, sync up, and we'll do a rough sync as always. Uh, Once again, these are not professionally recorded commentaries, so the sync will probably be a little bit on the rough side, but you should be able to get within the general area of where I am, or uh, if you're listening out there without watching the film and you're like me and like listening to commentaries on the go, uh, thank you so much, and hopefully my babbling isn't too much. but I, I would like to point out, I usually talk about the sound remixes on the early films, the mono films. Uh, Octopussy was the uh, one lone Bond film that was it does have a confirmed 70 millimeter blow up release. Uh, so it would have been, you know, uh, Dolby Stereo on the general release, and it is of course Dolby 70 millimeter uh, stereo on the 70 mil release. On disc, we got the Dolby Stereo always, and then eventually they upped that to 5.1 in the DVD era. But I will say I. I, you know, I do actually still prefer listening to it in the Dolby Stereo. I, I don't know what it was, but sometimes when MGM would uh, remix films uh, like that, they, it just doesn't have the same punch. So I, I would actually suggest on in this case with what's available on disc, if you have the option on a version you're watching, go and select the, uh, choosy called the Dolby Surround Stereo or Stereo Surround. Uh, select that track, which is, of course, uh, 2.0, and you can then matrix it back out in your home theater listening environment. Uh, it's just one of those minor things. The, the actual track, the, no effects are changed, thankfully, but it's just one of, really with all the 80s Bond films, I, I feel they still sound stronger in their original um, Stereo Surround incarnations, even though 5.1 is technically better being discrete. But uh, since I talked about the mono films, I figured I would mention those as well. Um, of course, the Laserdisc versions are still my preferred uh, sonic presentations of the Bond films at home. 
But uh, with that being said, uh, go ahead and go to the film and try and cue it up uh, right before the gun barrel starts. That way you're skipping the opening logos, which are going to differ on you know all different releases. And that way we can all try and start at the same sync point. Uh, of course, the logos here are a little bit different because this, of course, was the first film released as an MGM UA release. They still credit it as United Artists Presents, but this was the first film released after the uh, MGM buyout of United Artists had taken place. Uh, it had started negotiations-wise during For Your Eyes Only, but that was still released as UA only. Uh, but here, and from this point onward, it is fully MGM throughout, and you know they, they kept trying to drop the UA mention, but here we get that very short-lived white text United Artists presents that very plain logo, and that is that is the reason why. Uh, and of course, if you looked at the original versions of the film, they would actually have the uh, newly designed MGM UA Roaring Lion logo that had been created once the buyout happened. And of course, UA had been suffering for a while, and then Heaven's Gate came along, and that hurt them severely. In fact, For Your Eyes Only was a film that sort of uh, saved them a bit financially. But uh, anyway, that 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 buyout actually does cause a lot of hiccups and a lot of uh, struggles that started at this point that Cubby Broccoli had to spend more and more of his time dealing with and uh, trying to keep the Bond series out of the meddling hands of the revolving door of executives at the new MGM UA, uh, which is to this day still a problem and something the uh, producers at Eon still have to deal with and spend the majority of their time dealing with. And eventually this is what led to the six-year gap between License to Kill and Goldeneye and really robbed us of the third Timothy Dalton film. So it's interesting to note and very historically important that that starts really here at Octopussy, make, making it the first of the full MGM UA Bond films. So with all that out of the way, that's my pre-ramble as I like to call them. Let's go to the film and again try and go ahead to queue up to uh, sort of the black screen between the UA Presents logo and the start of the gun barrel and we will do a little rough sync and I'll do the usual count in. So in five, four, three, two, one, press play now. And so we are, of course, once again in the scope reshot gun barrel. Uh, you can tell immediately from the music that John Barry has returned to score his next Bond film after being away for For Your Eyes Only. And once again, you get that strange appearing United Star United Artists Presents logo, which once again shows this was the point at which MGM had taken over the studio. Now we open into the pre-title sequence in an undisclosed country. I've always wondered if perhaps this was, I believe it's meant to suggest Cuba, really, with the mention of Miami later on. This is a pre-title sequence in the Goldfinger mold, and that, of course, it doesn't have anything to do with the film to follow. And it's really refreshing in that sense because it had been a long while since we had gotten, uh, you know, the completely unrelated uh, pre-title sequence. Uh, For Your Eyes Only and uh, Octopussy are really, you know, a return to that idea uh, you know, because before that, pretty much every pre-tell sequence for a while had directly tied into the main story. And it's really interesting, this pre-tell sequence. It doesn't just do the Goldfinger, you know, quick bit of danger and excitement, but it actually does a really good job at setting the tone of the film and not just the lighthearted adventure elements, but also the serious spy craft because it's Bond on an infiltration mission. He has to adopt a disguise. And the idea of danger is already set up when, you know, we get the lines about the security has been increased and Bond is having to go, go ahead with it anyway. So it's already setting up in the pre-title sequence that this is going to be a film about adventure, but also have some spy craft. Now, here's a beautiful touch where Bond is on infiltration mode, disguised as Toro, but takes the time to address a soldier who doesn't properly salute him. It's a nice little wink at the audience moment, a great bit for Roger, but also playing the character to the hilt. John Barry already is weaving in the James Bond theme, which he does throughout the score to a rather large degree. So 
I've always wondered if maybe he was, uh, it was suggested or thought to be a good idea to use it as much as possible because uh, they were going to have to be going up against Never Say Never Again, which of course didn't have the James Bond theme right. So uh, obviously use what you have and sell the iconography. I've always loved the idea that, you know, Bond has a lookalike, but uh, the great anecdote is the man actually playing Toro is Roger Moore's longtime stand-in who, who had actually retired. So uh, they went and got him out of retirement just to play this this little part. And they do look really similar. So the idea really fits that Bond would be able to infiltrate uh, as Toro, but uh, just so happens that he happened to be there at the time. You can really see the resemblance there when they're in front of each other. So uh, you can definitely see how he was Roger Stanton for a long time. And once again, this is Bond on a real spy mission, and he has now actually failed and is being led off, obviously, to a prison camp to be interrogated and then executed. And he's even held at gunpoint. So even though this is a lighter film, we're already the, the, the danger element is still there, which is so key and vital to any Bond film. Without that, then, you know, what, what's the point? But even from this point, Roger is so relaxed and comfortable in the role that this little exchange here where he's able to distract the guards with the help of his lovely compatriot, it's just wonderfully played. And nobody else in the world could tell just a, a smile and that knowing glance before pulling the rip cords on the parachutes. And John Barry knows exactly how to score this. As always, I think Barry's key talent was being able to get to not just the heart of the scene, but the heart of the film's tone, really. So he is able to do the adventure elements, the humor as you see here, uh, but it's it's perfect underscoring because it's never too much, but it's just highlighting the the nice little bit of whimsy that's here in the pre-title sequence. And this starts the editing to speed up. And if you notice, every shot is held out just to the right exact moment and then cut on a dime, really. Uh, it, it doesn't do it at first, but really here when the pursuers start to come in, we see all these nice edits start to build and it starts to build a nice rhythm of, of suspense. And of course, at this point, we think, wow, Bond's been abandoned in a horse trailer. What is, what is this? And, uh, of course, this being the reveal of the Acro Star, but the, the false horse bomb is, is just a wonderful, silly gag. Now, of course, this is the real uh, Acro Star jet that was piloted by Corky Fornoff. Originally, they were going to use this in Moonraker, where Bond and Holly would fly over the uh, Iguazu Falls, but that got jettisoned, and, of course... Uh, as every wise production company does, even if you don't use an idea, you can always file it away and use it later. So uh, they wound up having all the aerial shots shot in Utah. So there's once again, a bit of location jumping, but uh, it's really re remarkable aerial footage, especially considering how small the Acro Star is. And all this stuff with the heat seeking missile is really well done, especially for the time period, because of course this is still pre-digital effects. Uh, so it's, it's done very simply, but it's beautifully effective, and it's really sold by the, uh, once again, the, the footage shot in Utah where you have the plane diving and, and going through all the passes and under the bridge, uh, but also by the fact this is a Dolby Stereo title, so there's a lot of nice, uh, w the whizzes especially when the missile goes past and then, you know, Bond dives the Acrostar out of the way. There's a lot of nice sound pans and things like that. So that helps to sell the sequence. And now Bond is going to be able to think on the fly, and this bit here where he flies the Acrostar through the hangar as a really inventive mixture of practical effects of actually flying the plane through and then, of course, miniature work. But especially here, the way they were able to actually get the plane through, get Roger in a mock-up, and then when the doors are closing, actually Corky Fornoff is flying through there. I mean, it just sells it. And then this model explosion... The way the panels fly off, uh, again, this, this is not Derek Mendings this time around, but you, it's just one of my favorite model explosion shots ever, just because of the veracity of the explosion and the way those, those panels come off. And then this is a wonderful way to close the sequence where, of course, Bond has spent his entire, entire fuel tank. And we get the wonderful bit that uh, was so great. Maris Bender used it in the teaser trailer with the... Uh, filled her up, please, at the gas station that just happens to be on the side of the road. 
And this is another moment that really only Roger could pull off with that perfect amount of deadpan, but not not pandering. Now we're into the title sequence, which is Morris Bender once again, and of course the Rita Coolidge theme song, All Time High, which was written by John Barry and had the lyrics written by Tim Rice. It's definitely a ballad, as Bond had really kind of been doing for the past number of films, and perhaps is the one that, I mean, it's definitely the one that usually appears on the most like in-store musics and things. Uh, but it's a song that grows on you with absolutely beautiful music. Uh, and John Barry uses this theme throughout the score, particularly for as the love theme of the score. But it's, it's a very relaxed song. It definitely grows on you. And it was obviously designed to be in the uh, Nobody Does It Better mold. Uh, of course, they would have loved to have had a song called Octopussy, but everyone very quickly realized that was pretty much an impossible task, to, especially to do with a straight face. Uh, John Barry in particular was like, how am I supposed to write a song called Octopussy? So uh, again, the all-time high idea is referencing the same sort of idea that we had with Nobody Does It Better and The Spy Who Loved Me. And they were actually able to, of course, use it in the uh, in the promotional materials, uh, not only selling Octopussy as the official Bond film and Roger Moore and using the gun barrel to make it stand out against Never Say Never Again, but also uh, use All Time High, uh, you know, James Bond's All Time High, uh, which is a really great usage of the uh, title theme in the uh, promotional posters. Now, Binder was starting to switch up his style. Uh, once again, he's using uh, images of Roger in the titles. I think it's really interesting when Bond himself, you see the visage of Bond in the titles. And I also like that he's starting to play around with the projected lights, which he will do further on A View to a Kill. But uh, it, it's it, it's an interesting title sequence. Again, Binder is always able to fit the song and he would drive everybody crazy because he would just be, you know, a traditional artist and not know what he was going to do or what he would want, and uh, always wanted to cut his titles to the sequ- to the music, but usually it just never synced up, and so the titles would be the last thing finished just before the premiere. Uh, once again, we see most of the same cast and crew returning, but there's the important credit uh, showing that the original writer was indeed George MacDonald Frazier. And I think th- that's the the key element that helps Octopussy have that classical, old-fashioned ad- adventure flavor. Again, uh, I-, I can't help but link it to Raiders of the Lost Ark coming out two years before. Um, I've always loved this. This is my favorite part of the end titles, the very uh, beautiful, uh, elegant-looking model for the director's credit. And then we immediately go into hardcore spy territory because we're here at East Berlin, right here at the Berlin Wall, Checkpoint Charlie and everything, which is, you know, spy, uh, classic spy material headquarters 101 for, you know, every spy story of the Cold War known to man. And we are introduced to 009 here. Of course, we know none of what is going on. We're seeing a clown run from a circus, running, apparently terrified for his life. It's a very striking sequence, but once again, we have no idea what's going on. So this right here is setting the, uh, the mystery of the film in motion. And we are drawn in to the story because... It is beautifully laid out. Uh, We see the clown scared, but we don't know why he's scared until we see the knife blade glinting in the dark. So at first you think he's just trying to escape from the guards or something. And then we also have a wonderful bit of drama with the balloon popping, giving his position away and seeing one the the uh the person chasing him over on one side but then we get the beautiful shock reveal of the fact that it's actually a pair of knife throwing twins when the other is directly in front of him it's a nice bit of misdirection that at first is so jarring it, it's a real surprise and it's it's beautifully handled because see there you see him running in the background and then we get this moment here turn reveal and suddenly we think it's the same guy how is that possible and we don't get the full impetus of this until they're actually shown in the next shot together and, of course, identically dressed. And John Barry immediately comes in with his very ominous-sounding score uh, cue, which, again, no one could sell a Bond film like John Barry could. And, as always, he finds the right tone for each individual scene. 
And it really helps sell the seriousness of this, even though we're at this point seeing just a, a clown getting murdered outside the Berlin Wall, which seems, once again, quite bizarre. And it definitely is a striking thing because it feels ominous. It's nothing you've ever seen before, completely out of bizarro world. But it's it's great that uh, you know, as as in most films, you know, a knife uh, a knife throw will immediately kill somebody. But here, Double uh, Nine has managed to survive just long enough to get to the British Embassy. And this sequence of him, get, you know, literally gate crashing, is really striking. Particularly the the first person viewpoint handheld camera work there, when we see the bloody hands grasp the doors. But especially here, when he crashes through the glass and the uh, the Fabergé egg rolls out of his hand, it's introducing us to the egg. But it's a wonderfully striking moment. A dead clown crashes through the windows, and then the egg rolls out of his hand. John Barry's final cue, and then we get that one haunting shot of his dead corpse there, but it has the hanging balloon. That's a moment that's always st- uh, stuck with me, and once again, it really sets the mystery element. So now, of course, we're in M's office, have to have the money penny moment. Now you see there, Bond has the hat, but hangs it up, so we don't get the hat toss. This, again, will be the, one of the last times we even see the hat. Uh, of course, we are introduced to Penelope Smallbone, who is only in this one film as Moneypenny's assistant. And uh, it's sort of a way to, to freshen up the traditional idea and, and play around with the age of the of the actors who are still in the film. But of course, I'm sure Lois Maxwell was probably less than pleased having to share her one scene with somebody else. Um, there's, a, there's a great anecdote where in one of the takes, instead of saying uh, Penelope Smallbone, she wound up saying Penelope Smallbush, which is just just cracked everybody up. But uh, it's it's a wonderful uh, little idea to sort of freshen up the traditional Bond money penny uh, banter back and forth. And I love how she has the little sigh at the end. <laughs> now we're in M's office, where, of course, M is now played by Robert Brown, who would last through the Timothy Dalton era. Robert Brown was a, a longtime friend of Roger Moore's. They've been in many television shows and films together. And he has a really nice bearing as M. Uh, the idea being that, uh, like... Uh, Jeffrey, Cre- Jeffrey Keen as Freddie Gray, he is, uh, you know, reprising the role we saw him in in The Spy Who Loved Me. So the idea, it's never explicitly, expressly said, but the idea is that uh, this is the Admiral Hargreaves we saw in Spy just promoted to him. This is, of course, Douglas Woolmer as Jim Fanning, and I love the idea of the service having all of the various, uh, you know, facets and various experts in different fields, as uh, uh, Fleming alludes to in a lot of the novels. The idea of the inner workings of MI6 having all these uh, various people who have greater knowledge, but as you see here, he's kept in the dark out of the top secret elements. So... When he starts going to detail, everybody starts to roll their eyes and they excuse him. And of course, because he's not fully classified and he's just the art man, then he goes out. And here we are introduced to the uh, first usage of Fleming material, the property of a lady short story, which is why we have the Sotheby's auction. And uh, the story originally was about trying to expose the Russian mole in MI6 and how she was paid off via the selling of goods at Sotheby's. But uh, here we are linked to the clown we saw, revealed that it's 009. That sets the seriousness of the idea of the plot, why Bond is being sent out, and they try to rationalize why the Russians would be selling off great antiquities. And you have the line with Freddie Gray saying, you know, it could be a way for them to raise currency because they, they are, you know— hard up for it in, in, that, in those terms to uh, finance covert, op- covert operations, for example. So there is an important reason why MI6 would be, have stumbled onto this jewelry smuggling caper and then want to investigate it, uh, you know, because without that, you'd be wondering, well, why is Bond investigating a jewelry smuggling ring? Now we go to the Russian high command in this wonderfully designed Peter Lamont set, which uh, definitely has some Dr. Strangelove war room vibes to it. Uh, and the Dr. Strangelove connection goes further because here we have Stephen Burkoff playing General Orloff, who is the main, uh, well, the main co-villain of the film. And his character is very much inspired by George C. Scott's Buck Turgidson in Dr. Strangelove being the very... 
uh, war hungry, uh, you know, overpowering general who can give these great fiery speeches. And uh, Stephen Burkhoff is known for being a great uh, experimental stage actor and being just full of vigor and able to literally not just chew scenery, but obliterate scenery. And his monologue here with the wonderful Peter Lamont set and the visuals of the, the map, uh, once again, immediately makes you flash to uh, George C. Scott and Dr. Strangelove. But the way that Burkhoff has this this wonderful charm and, and inside this, you know, obviously this complete psychopath with a, with a thirst for conquest. Uh, it's, it's very chilling, especially here where, you know, the rest of the room has gone dark and we see his silhouette going on and on about a lightning thrust to essentially take back uh, the entire European continent just because they can. It's, it's very striking. And then I love that it becomes a back and forth with General Gogol, played once again by Walter Gotel. And we get the entirety of the Russian high command and the entirety of Orlov's character in one scene. So when we get his full motivation much later in the film and his full plot, which isn't revealed until really the third act, it makes sense because we've had the groundwork laid for that in this scene. And we can see how how crazy Orlov can get. Uh, you know, if he can get this worked up over, over talking about literally taking back the entire European continent and that uh, he doesn't care about uh, NATO um, atomic reprisals. You know, the West is decadent and divided. They also got this wonderful uh, stand-in for uh, for Brezhnev here, who looks so remarkably like Brezhnev. Of course, that helps sell the sequence. Once again, uh, props must go to Peter Lamont for this amazing set. I really love the the giant portraiture of Lenin built into the background and, and the wall next to the giant world map as well. It's just a really remarkable set, and the revolving table immediately makes you think of uh, Ken Adams' Goldfinger Rumpus Room as well. So it, it looks like it, this is a real place that exists. I have to mention here, the uh, this is the first Bond film that actually has some location tags. Location tags become much more prevalent in modern films, but it's just interesting to note this is the first Bond film to really have lo a few location tags and uh, on-screen subtitles. And of course, we immediately know this is a bad guy because we have uh, one of the knife twins here in the Kremlin art repository. This, of course, is setting up how and why the uh, jewelry smuggling is going on. Lincoln is hoping to smuggle these out and, and uh, pass off uh, duplicates made uh, as the real thing. But since 009 obviously got away with the Fabergé egg, it remains that... Lincoln is breaking out, and Orlov has this the great line, we must have the genuine egg back. And then the line here, I hope we can reach them in time, immediate edit to Sotheby's. So once again, even though Octopussy has this more laid-back feel, which allows you to enjoy and bask in the, the richer flavor, it is still remarkably well cut together. And that, of course, is you have John Glenn directing, who knows exactly how long he needs to let a scene run, and then where exactly had he still been in the editing room where he would have cut it. Uh, once again, I have to point out there, the a gentleman on the other side of the main bidder's table with the white hair who will uh, take a closer look at the egg once more with the glasses and the pen is uh, Cubby Broccoli's old friend who uh, has a number of serious cameos. Now, of course, Roger Moore is you know, visibly older in this film, and they have redone his hairstyling and makeup, so it's a bit different than what we saw in Four Your Eyes Only. But it, the film really works with his advanced age, and I think the relaxed tone and the uh, greater focus on a more adventure style definitely befits that. And they, they, his age never becomes an issue. And this is setting up the traditional Bond battle of wits inside of a uh, civil atmosphere with the villain. Now we're introduced to both Magda and Kamal Khan, played by Louis Jordan, who was actually a longtime friend of Rogers. They had uh, met each other during their days at uh, MGM in the 1950s. And Jordan himself is a very elegant man, 
And I think it's very helpful anytime the villain has Bondian elements, so they could uh, very much seem as like the dark reflection of Bond himself, and that helps the sort of tete-a-tete between Bond and villain. So I love the fact that Kamal Khan is very Bond-like, and Louis Jordan had at various points actually been even considered as a potential Bond. Uh, which I think is also a nice touch. And, of course, he and Roger had had a long-standing friendship, so, of course, they're able to play off each other extremely well. Now, Bond involving himself in the bidding and trying to get a read on Khan and seeing that he does have to buy it, but why would he have to buy this egg? How is he tied into all this? This is a remarkable battle of wits, and all without any dialogue between Bond and villain, which makes it even more... Uh, beautifully impactful because we can get the sense that Bond is toying with Khan and of course here he does the switcheroo which we don't know yet but of course once once you're a Bond fan and you watch this film over and over you look at Roger's hand passing under the book and it's like okay could he could he have really done that like that's amazing sleight of hand and then the way he plays with the nods and he ag- see, see, t- pretends to agonize a little bit over well he'll, whether he'll bid again or not and we see Khan getting more and more uh you know getting his feathers ruffled and then Bond lets it uh, lets it stretch out just a little bit longer then finally just shaking his head and then they exchange the glance as Khan leaves and Bond with the eyes of steel I doubt it he had to buy that's what I tend to find out. That's, the, of course, the entire meaning of the scene, and that allows us to work in the uh, auction sequence from the original property of a lady's short story, but beautifully tied in to the main plot of the film. And once again, getting back to the idea of the plot being doled out as a mystery and allowing the audience to, along with Bond, start to gra- gather the various puzzle pieces and put them together. It's a brilliant way of involving the audience. Another bit of spycraft here, Bond having Khan's, play, Khan's car tailed, of course, to the airport. And we get a nice shot of Jeremy Bullock as the returning character of Smithers, who usually turns up inside of Q's lab, where he'll be in his next appearance in the film. And I love any time Bond can use his ingenuity, his wit, where he's not being ordered to do something. Because, of course, Bond is the primary intelligence field agent of MI6 and has instincts of his own. This is something that really comes to the fore in the 80s era. And here we see Bond has acted on his own impulses. He has done a correct reading of Kamal Khan and has exchanged the fake egg for the real one and will now use that as a bargaining chip to not only go out to India where Khan is, but to use it as a weapon to provoke and perhaps get more information out of Khan, who now has the false one. And, of course, Bond has already ordered the plane ticket for India, which shows had M not gone along with this plan, Bond would have just gone anyway, which, again, I love the ingenuity of that. And then the final gag of having to sign a waiver chit for the valuable government property of the Fabergé egg. Once again, perfect hard edit. Now we're firmly in India. No beating around the bush. And this wonderfully majestic John Barry cue as we see this helicopter going past the Taj Mahal, which, of course... Geographically, the Taj Mahal is is not near Udaipur where they shot, so it's obviously playing around with geographical locales a bit. But, of course, if you have the chance to show the Taj Mahal, of course, you're going to use it, being one of the wonders of the world. And this immediately gives us the just fantastic sense of globetrotting that Bond is known and revered for, and something that just doesn't really exist in films anymore. Of course, we have all the bright colors, and uh, I think Alan Hume really plays that up throughout all of the Indian sequences rather well. Not not going over the top, but a nice subtle bit. And this, of course, is one of my favorite in-jokes in the series, where the introduction of VJ as a snake charmer starts playing the James Bond theme. It's definitely fourth wall breaking, but it's so beautifully sublime, so quick. And then... Most people overlook this. We get another code phrase exchange. So just like in For Your Eyes Only, we have Bond meet his contact and use actual spycraft going right back to the famous exchange in From Russia With Love. So Octopussy, while it's usually called the very Roger Moore Bond and very silly and things, it is a Cold War spy story. And there is actual spycraft throughout. And I love it for that. 
Now, of course, Vijay Armitras was, was an extraordinarily world-famous tennis player and not a member of Actor, Actors' Equity. So they s started throwing a fuss, and uh, they, the production went and got Albert Moses to play uh, Sadruddin. He had previously appeared as the barman and the spy who loved me. And uh, I like the fact that Bond meets with two co local MI6 contacts, and we sort of have the head of section and the agent of section. We get the we get the few fun tennis references. Uh, you know, VJ has installed himself as a tennis pro as his cover, and yeah, was he learned? My backhand's improved. And it, of course, this is right out of classic adventure storytelling, setting up the villain's palace. It's heavily card guarded. He'll play in the casino at night. You'll be able to confront him there. So it's setting up the face to face confrontation. Now, this is a fun line I missed for the longest time. Bond says, you may need this to play with your asp. And then we get an edit, and uh, we see the lovely uh, woman in bikini walking by from the behind. So that's a, that's a definite um, <laughs> editorial joke to go along with the uh, line that precedes it. Once again, a beautiful atmosphere. And of course, it's just Bond checking into a hotel. But I've always loved these transitional moments because, once again, it's selling the idea of Bond and globetrotting and... And of course, you have all of these beautiful women everywhere just staring intently at Roger, you know. Hope you enjoy your stay. I'm sure I shall. And then I love the bit here when Bond is being shown the room. He has the slight, slight smile. And then she says, anything at all? Maybe later. It's just enough. You don't, you don't have to overplay moments like that. But, uh, of course... Bond is known for having pretty girls everywhere in the film series, but uh, it's it's always better when it's just the the slight insinuations instead of uh, you know really going full tilt as uh, was a criticism of the BB doll character in Forty Eyes Only. But we're once again back to the mystery here because Bond goes out on the balcony, sees the boat with crewed by all these beautiful women, and he sees Magda get off. So he knows he's definitely obviously on the right trail and for the first time sees the crest of the octopus cult. So that, of course, will it be called back on much later in the film when he sees uh, the tattoo on Magda and finally understands what it signifies when he gets to Octopussy's Island. Now, this is a fun in-joke most people are not going to get unless they're diehard fans and read a lot of production materials. But uh, it's very well known that Cubby Broccoli and Roger Moore started a long-running series of backgammon games throughout the production of all the films and uh, would just play endlessly between takes as a way to pass the time. Their stakes would get ridiculously high, but they would always up them to make sure nobody, they would sort of cancel out the debt to each other. And so by the end of a film, one would owe the other like, you know, $1,000 or something because they would just have played like, you know, several hundred games of backgammon for the past six months. Um, so, of course, it's it's India and it's a casino setting. So obviously they wanted to do something different than the traditional Baccarat or Chemin de Fer, which is Bond's game of choice. But I love the fact that uh, I, I'm sure it must have been an in-joke for the fact that this backgammon game that never ended now, well, they just put backgammon in the film. We get this lovely bit between Bond and Magda here and this, this nice back and forth where she's very mysterious. And I have to say, Christina Wayborn as Magda is just so... One again, very mysterious, uh, with the long flowing hair and the very deep gaze. So she really has a striking presence in all her scenes, even when there's not a lot of dialogue. All the reaction shots, she just looks so elegant. Uh, so again, I've always liked that. That just even some of the character performances really add to the sort of mysterious quality of how the plot is doled out. And the idea of the villain cheating is a classic Fleming touch, but cheating in the a gambling scenario makes you think of Goldfinger cheating at cards. But uh, since they borrow some lines from the actual Moonraker novel and this setup, it very much resembles uh, the way Bond is introduced to Drax and the Moonraker novel cheating at cards at the Blades Club and how Bond turns the tables on him by cheating himself. Of course, Bond takes over for a obviously retired British major, going back to the traditional idea of the uh, British colonial majors uh, retired in India. So Bond has obviously seen that Kamal is up to something. He's seen him hold the die and knows that he's using loaded dice, but still plays his own game, doubles it to 200,000 rupees, even though he has... I've always wondered what Bond is thinking at this moment, because... 
he's prodding the villain. He puts the Fabergé egg out as collateral, which, you know, is, is the mic drop, as it were, of the scene. And Roger plays it beautifully. And the way that Khan has to react without showing very much, but everyone can tell something is being exchanged between the two men. And, but I've wondered how Bond is going to get himself out of this because he's, he's done all this and he has to have a double six, but the setup where he decides to use Kamal's dice and the idea of player privilege, it's beautifully rendered and Roger plays it perfectly because if you look, he starts doing it and he never looks down at the dice we, see, we hear him throw it, he looks, he says double six, and only then do we see it. And Bond does it without looking, because, of course, he knows the, dices are, the, the dice are loaded. And uh, if you didn't quite catch that at first, when you saw Kamal's hand go down, it would explain it to the audience members who didn't quite catch that. Now, here's the borrowing from Moonraker, the spend the money quickly, Mr. Bond. That is a direct quote that uh, Drax uses in Moonraker, when Bond has turned the tables by cheating. So this is, once again, borrowing a Fleming piece that had not been used, because, of course, Moonraker was, you know, totally didn't use the novel's plot, uh, but uh, the entire opening at the Blades Club with Bond being uh, introduced to Drax, uh, that is getting a nice bit of Fleming in here to really add to the story. And here is another fourth wall nod. Of course, Gobinda crushing the dice is uh, right out of Goldfinger with Aja crushing the golf ball. But what I've always loved is when he crushes the dice, we see the sand coming out. So really showing the fact that the dice were loaded. So uh, that should let everybody who is standing around know the fact that uh, Kamal Khan was cheating the major the whole time. But it uh, seems they don't realize that. And of course, it's fun that Bond has just now won a giant chunk of change. And I love the fact that he gives both Sadrid and BJ some, but unfortunately the line uh, keep you in curry for a few weeks is now sort of Winstead. It's not meant to be uh, derogatory at all, but it's often viewed that way now. Um, it, it drowns out Roger's next line as he's exiting. You know, it's a wonderful racket this, which is a, a nice, charming line because, of course, Bond and now his MI6 station cohorts just now have a chunk of change to play around with. But, you know, showing the intensified action of the 80s films, we go from the traditional Bond villain confrontation over the gambling table, and we're right into a full-on action sequence with this chase of the Tuk Tuks. And, well, it's it's very interestingly using uh, Indian iconography, but not doing it in an overbearing or cliched way. And, of course... This being the primary transport mode through the town, it would make sense that the MI6 transport uh, is souped up a bit. So it's it's much more believable than the motorized gondola in Moonraker, but the sort of same idea. But uh, obviously, you don't want to cheat Kamal because he's going to immediately send a whole squad of goons after you. VJ using a tennis racket is the other big tennis in-joke, but also since his cover is a tennis pro, it, it, it makes sense that he would have a tennis racket. Uh, the crowd looking back and forth is is a bit of a nod to Bollywood films. And the cyclist going through there was literally a cyclist who broke through due to the intensive crowds in the middle of the shoot going on, and they just left it in. The idea of the hero getting stabbed, seemingly killed, but saved by something in the pocket is right out of classical adventure storytelling. It's a total cliche, but it's done beautifully because John Barry comes right in with the cue at that time. And he starts bringing in the James Bond theme, but with a particular use of triangle that has this sense of old-fashioned charm and fun because we're having fun. It's a chase, the, but we see the, the wad of cash go into the, the, the beggar's bowl. Uh, we see the blade go into the door, and we see the jeep full of goons crash. So it's, it's accentuating the fun of the chase, which is always welcome. And definitely something you just don't see in films anymore. Now Bond gets off on foot, and we have the transition back to Pinewood, because, of course, the location of Udaipur and the crowd control was so ridiculously difficult to do that this sequence was practically impossible to pull off. So they wound up, uh, Peter Lamont had to construct all of this back at Pinewood, and it's a remarkable set. 
Uh, it looks literally like the real location, but the blending between uh, location footage and set footage is practically seamless outside of the actual um, the film stock sort of betraying it a little bit, which, of course, is going to happen anytime you mix uh, footage like that. So we have various bits of iconography. We have the bed of nails and the walking over fire and the sword swallower. Yes, it's a little bit on the cheesy side, sure, but... It's the fun of the sequence is how Bond plays with them and uses his ingenuity once again instead of a Q gadget. And Roger does it with aplomb. He plays it seriously because, of course, Bond is still fighting for his life, but he's using everything around him even though he's just, you know, burned a guy on hot coals. And then the classic line, you better stick that back yourself. It's the classical one-liner, but giving that right dose of humor to keep that element of the light touch, but it's still a serious sequence. So it's once again interesting, Bond and VJ are actually barely able to escape, but they do so with the Bond fanfare really coming in when Bond and VJ toss the money. And of course, uh, using something like a great amount of money to distract a crowd to get in front of the pursuers once again, classical adventure elements, but Octopussy plays around with these. It doesn't just do them. It does them so well and so intrinsically that they feel earned, and it's really nice to see some of these classic ideas that really had been gone from cinema for a great amount of time and have been since. And I, again, once again, I have to say the influence of Indiana Jones is definitely felt uh, and inspired, I, I think, the sort of throwback vibe of classical adventure that you get throughout the film, particularly in the first half here in the uh, India sequences. So, of course, on location, we have to have the uh, Q Lab. So this is the Indian branch of Q's lab. And once again, poor Desmond is frustrated and... Uh, would have to deal with uh, Roger and the rest of the queue, mess, uh, the, the rest of the crew messing around with his lines and his queue cards while he's trying to get all the technical specs down just pat. As usual, Bond has lost his weapon, and he says PPK, but if you look closely in the tuk tuk and later on when we see a nice close up uh, underneath the train car, he's actually using a Walther P5. So this is one of the few films where uh, Bond is using a different weapon. That was probably at the, the request of the Walther company that was uh, had just developed it. Uh, the P5 was their new handgun. Because you also see Sean Connery use it in Never Say Never Again. Not that I'm a firearms expert by any means, but I just suddenly noticed eventually it's a different gun. Once again, that's Jeremy Bullock as, as uh, Smithers there with the door. And I've always loved the idea of the studded smashing door, but it looks remarkably similar to some of the doors on the Monsoon Palace. So I always, as a kid, I wondered... And did some of Kamal Khan's doors also have the similar effect? So we're introduced to the main gadgetry of the film here, the listening device inside the Fabergé egg, and the all-important uh, listening bug pen with uh, hydrochloric acid mixture. And of course also the uh, Psycho watch with the liquid crystal display inside and the range finder, which will allow Bond to track the Fabergé egg with the bug device inside. So, once again, there is real spycraft going on here because uh, they're setting up the egg to be stolen and Bond will track that and also be able to monitor what uh, Khan and the rest of the villains are talking about and try and figure out what the plot is, which, of course, is what any spy would be doing. Now, the... the um the TV watch doesn't really have a lot to do in the film. We get the reprise and the climax. Uh, but, of course, this was an emerging technology, and the the production found out about it. And so they're like, oh, we've got to have that in the film somewhere. So that's another great example of the Bond team always trying to keep up on technological advancements and try and incorporate that into the films where they could to try and make them seem up to date and have a bit of that gee whiz feel to the technology to you know have just the nice little bits of possible fantasy because they were bits of technology that were in the real world. 
So we are here back at the pool at the hotel at night, beautifully lit. And this is the perfect time to once again mention Alan Hume's photography. Uh, Alan Hume once again shot three Bond films in a row, Four Your Eyes Only, Octopussy, and View to a Kill. Uh, in between, he shot Return of the Jedi, uh, which uh, was for Richard Marquand, who he'd worked on, on uh, Eye of the Needle. And as I said in the Four Your Eyes Only track, if you look at Hume's three Bond films, they have a tendency to have a a slightly softer look to the image. not Maybe not quite a full-blown soft focusing look or a look of diffusion, but it's a really, it's, it's a very intricate, it's a very different look to the Bond films, which are known primarily for usually being very sharp and clear, which is what uh, Cubby Broccoli always insisted on being very important, that the audience would be able to get every key story element because there was not a lot of camera trickery going on. And Ted Moore really set that tone on Dr. No. So I, I really like what Hume does with the look of Octopussy. It is definitely, you know, it is a little bit softer, but it's every setup is very uh, handsomely composed. And once again, he does some really interesting stuff with the color, particularly in the Indian sequences. Every time we're in India, you see here the blues of the pool water, the skin tones, the light coming off the candles on the table and the candelabra. Uh, and of course, particularly in the close-ups of Roger and, uh, particularly in the in the close-ups of Roger and uh, Christina here, uh, the, the skin tones and the lighting on the faces really comes across well. And that goes right into the love scene where we have the traditional slow pan over the discarded clothes. But this is, this is a really well-done scene because it is like Moonraker, uh, both people are acting under you know under du with duplicitous means because of course bond is merely trying to allow magda to think that she has stolen the egg so then they can uh trace it to Khan and go from there and follow the plot and uh bond is having to do this while pretending to be uh, blissfully unaware and you know obviously a little bit not quite thick-headed, but he's he's definitely playing a little bit of a role, allowing himself to be led on and allowing Magda to think that she has hoodwinked him, uh, which we get more of that when uh, they get up and it's morning and she goes to make her exit and we get the uh, playing around with the egg. Now Bond spots the tattoo and we get the iconic that's my little octopusy line, which Bond has a slight... Roger gives that that slight moment of it's not an eye roll, but it's what everybody in the audience was doing. So it helps helps sell it a little bit. And it's it's always funny when you look at the way they actually go to embrace again. Uh, it's Magda seems to definitely take a bit more of an aggressive uh, aggressive stance. And there's an outtake they use, that that uh, Binder used in the trailer that's that's quite humorous. But here we see. Uh, the roles come out, Kamal Khan get motions on, it's night outside, he leaves Gobinda out, and look up at the window. So it's it's setting up what's to come, but John Barry's cue starts to set this this wonderful tone of it's not quite regretful, but it's very romantic, very it's it's very poetic. And the way that Magda leaves here and the, the, the idea of, of the sari being sort of the knotted bed sheets to escape out the window and the way she goes over gracefully, but Bond knows she's going to escape somehow. We see the egg reflected in the mirror and we know that Bond knows exactly what he's doing when he's playing around. What is the time to, to activate the, the tracker on the Seiko? So the fact that we know that Bond is playing a role, we get to enjoy how this scene is being played out because each one is playing the other and they they both know that each one sort of knows what's going on but the the bit action speak louder than words and the way she goes over backwards and then we get the long shot where the sari wraps off and then she's practically you know in in her undies there but the way the sari blows in the wind and khan has a thing to drape over and he looks up at bond bond gives the little nod he has the egg and they drive off into the dawn with the beautiful music going. It's one of the most striking moments in the entire series. And then immediately cut with the surprise of Gobinda knocking out Bond. Once again, a Goldfinger reference, most likely being with, uh, you know, Oddjob knocking out Bond before uh, Jill Masterson is killed. 
So that that of course is the scene that that scene most resembles, but it's got that remarkable sense of poetry to it. And that goes right into this next transitional scene of Khan going to Octopussy's Island, but with this very mysterious, exotic John Barry Q introducing us to seeing Octopussy's Island for the first time. And the fact that it's Kamal Khan on this beautiful, large boat, entirely crewed by lovely girls at the oars. It's definitely, it's just something you would do not expect to see. And of course, now we're introduced to the island full of beautiful women. So it's definitely something right out of classical adventure stories. And I love the uh, tracking shot here behind Khan being led by the two beautiful blondes through the archways. And, you know, it's sort of giving this this ominous quality. And we stop here and we see them walk off. And now uh, John Barry will start laying in a darker quality to the music because even though there are all these beautiful girls around, it's this very mysterious place we've never been here before it's our first time seeing this and we don't know what exactly is going on so we can see that Khan is going to meet with someone who is ostensibly the lead villain who is kept in shadow and we don't see who they are but this is our first glimpse of the mysterious octopusy as Bond will later say complete with her robe having the octopus cult on the back in a very large ornate design and in a very blowfield type touch, she's not feeding her fish, she's feeding her pet fish and, of course, octopus as well. So it definitely makes octopus seem very ominous, which helps that when she's finally revealed uh, as not being the lead villain, as it were, it's a nice bit of, uh, once again, audience displacement and gives a nice surprising uh, moment to the plot, which, once again, is really enjoying doling out everything as a mystery. Now, great moment there when Khan says Bond's name. As soon as he says Bond's name, we see the hand freeze. And then, of course, is showing Octopus. He recognizes Bond for some reason, and uh, we don't know yet, you know, why. But we know there's some sort of past history there, which, again, adds to the mystery of the character, makes the audience more interested. And then, of course, a fun little bit uh, before Khan introduces Bond's name. Uh, you know, he calls him uh, an Englishman, basically an adventurer. Uh, he likes Fabergé eggs and uh, likes dice, preferably loaded. So it's it's a nice little dig at Bond, even though Bond isn't there, sort of insinuating he's this English character that's a bit of a cheat and things like that. So I, I love that little bit of villain ego it's a, it's a throwaway line but it's a nice little bit that adds so much to Khan's character that even in that moment he's going to be like well no I didn't cheat I only lost because this Bond is such a cheater he's this you know fat-headed Englishman and he cheats at backgammon you know it's, it's just a little touch I've always loved and once again it's a throwaway line but it adds so much to, to his character and another thing here same thing we see Khan get out, but you see Louis Jordan look at the egg, and he just tosses it from one hand to the other nonchalantly. It's a it's a nice little bit of, of natural uh, naturalistic acting. We see Bond awaken. He realizes very quickly he's a prisoner. Of course, there's bars on the window, but uh, he sees the egg is coming closer on the rangefinder, then sees Khan get out, knows he's trapped at the Monsoon Palace as a prisoner. So he's on the right trail, but he's unfortunately a prisoner, and then lovely little reveal of Gobinda again. Bond's going to slip out the door. Gobinda appears. Can't complain about the valet service. Then at 8 o'clock, we get the classic idea of the hero kept a prisoner, and uh, but he's going to be served a nice dinner. So, of course, Bond puts on the tuxedo and is brought to dinner. And we get the classical Bond villain exchange over the dinner table, which goes all the way back to Dr. No and is right out of Fleming. But with this setting and the sort of old world touches and classical adventure storytelling isms that are in this scene, it feels, you know, very much straight out of a classic adventure yarn, which is definitely what they went for here. But it's still a Bond film. It still retains its identity. But I love that they felt not only the need, but they felt they had the ability to play around with this sort of idea. 
And this is the scene that I think definitely uh, inspired some things in Temple of Doom, particularly the uh, dinner scene with the various gross-out plates. Well, here we have the bit with the stuffed sheep's head with the eyeballs that stick out. And, of course, Khan will uh, pluck one out and eat it with great vigor. So uh, I've always felt that Spielberg is a confirmed, uh, you know, Bond fanatic like like we all are, but... uh, I've always felt that this had to be a direct inspiration. So I've always felt that Raiders uh, sort of inspired Octopussy in certain ways, and then Octopussy sort of definitely inspired Temple of Doom in certain ways. And I love this exchange where Khan is talking about how they prefer to interrogate their um, would-be guests and uh, the curare with the psychedelic compound, to which Bond replies, yes, but with uh, with, uh, certain brain damage. An unfortunate side effect but I love that they lead up to it where Bond is guessing how they torture people. Thumbscrews and hot coals. We're more civilized here. We'll just kill your brain off. And then the allusion to the eyeballs of the sheep's head being very much like Gobinda's eyes. And I love that for once, Bond is a gourmet, actually refuses to eat something, but then we see Khan just just enjoy and savor the eyeball, and he gets that little bit of stuff on his lip almost, so... It's, it's a nice way to end the scene, but I've always loved the, the intensity at which Louis Jordan eats the eyeball. Now there, when Jordan turns around in the tuxedo and he and Bond have that moment, Khan and Bond, you can definitely see, because it's a very elegant marble staircase and uh, Louis Jordan is in a tuxedo, you can see the Bondisms in Kamal Khan. So yes, he is this Af- uh, exiled Afghan prince and has that whole backstory. But it, once again, I think it's always so rewarding when the villain is sort of the dark mirror reflection of Bond and has some of the Bondian flourishes in his character and his general makeup. So I always I think that's a particular moment where you can really see that. And of course, he's always very elegantly dressed throughout the film as well. So, of course, we have the, again, classical story idea of now the hero is going to escape. So Bond uses the aforementioned Q-pen with the acid mixture, you know, dissolves all metal. Well, good thing it works on the uh, Monsoon Palace bars. And here, Roger is once again clothed in the iconic safari suit. But here it does make sense. And, of course, since we will lead into the manhunt uh, in the jungle, it definitely fits that he would be in a safari suit. It, it's it's an element of clothing that, of course, is very dated and everybody likes to laugh at. But I've always loved it. Um, I've always loved safari cell shirts anyway. Now, there is the pigeon. That is the John Glenn jump scare of the film. Uh, John Glenn was very fond and both his editing and his later direction of having animals or objects be jump scares to get the audience, you know, on the edge of their seats or wake them up a bit, as it were. And he definitely loved using white pigeons. So uh, as he did in Four Your Eyes Only during the Matura climb, here Bond is once again spooked by a bird coming out of nowhere. Now, this is the point at which, if you've been wondering why did we have to look at General Orloff, what's going on about the jewelry smuggling, this as is the point of the film where the two villain plots are converging. So here, Bond is simply trying to escape, but uh, as in Goldfinger, because he hangs around a bit longer, uh, he's able to uncover more of the full villain plot, because now he sees a Russian general land complete with guards in a Soviet helicopter, and... He's like, okay, now what in the world is going on here? That's General Orloff. So now he knows he has to find out exactly what's going on and get back into the palace. But he's hanging out on Magda's balcony and has to wait for her to be distracted enough so he can slip through. But, of course, it's alluded to that Magda knows that Bond was there and has escaped and then doesn't say anything. She does that little knowing smile uh, in, in in the next few shots when she looks through the door. So... It's an interesting uh, sort of idea that uh, since later on we realize that, you know, Octopussy has the Octopus cult and they work with Khan, but they're sort they're sort of separate but together. So this idea that maybe Octopussy has her own agent inside the Monsoon Palace and uh, thus Magda will not necessarily tell Khan everything. So it's the shot coming up here where we see Bond go down and follow Khan, Gobinda, and Orloff. But this shot here of Magda giving that little smile 
Well, she obviously doesn't say anything about Bond escaping. So again, setting up that idea that she has other uh, other orders. And of course, once again, when we realize that there's technically three villain camps in the jewelry smuggling keeper later on, that once again, Magda sort of operates as like octopusy spy within the Monsoon Palace. Now, this scene is actually quite interesting because if you look very closely, we see exactly how the jewelry duplicates were made. They were made here in the Monsoon Palace by these two uh, would-be technicians with all the photographs and things. And we, for the first time, see all of them put in this canister that will, of course, be uh, seen again on the helicopter and the train cars later in the film. And I love the line. It's a bit of a throwaway line, but, you know, oh, can these guys be trusted? Oh, yes, absolutely. We have ways of dealing with them. And then, of course, in the next in the next scene, we see their corpses. Now, this is a, a gag I absolutely love. Magda's using her hair dryer, so Q's hypersensitive gadget doesn't work. So once again, this is forcing Bond to use his ingenuity, and this is the key crucial part of the plot, because this is about the, uh, the circus that Karl Marx Stott and what uh, Orloff and Khan are planning. But because of the hair dryer interrupting the bug, Bond can only hear select words. So he literally has to go over to the crack in the doorway, and he's trying to hear through the door. And then she stops using it for a minute, and he's able to hear one week from today in Karl Marx Stott, Karl Marx Stott. And so he knows, okay, now whatever it is is going to happen in Karl Marx Stott in one week. And that's literally all he's got. And so he's having to use his wits and... For once, Q does not come through, and his gadget is foiled and does not work. So it forces Bond to use his wits, play detective longer, and all he knows is the location and the time. He has nothing else to go on. And I love how Orloff has this sort of charm when he realizes, oh, you recovered it. Well, you must eliminate that guy. And Khan doesn't want to go into the details of, of who Bond is. But this little bit here is wonderful. The way that that uh, Khan is just wincing because Orloff has accidentally smashed the real Fabergé egg. But of course, this serves important plot purpose because it reveals the bug. It's, of course, interesting though that Khan knows that that little piece of metal is a bug, but uh, also shows his ingenuity because he recognizes the tiny bug inside the wreckage of the Fabergé egg but it's just a great bit where Orloff mistakes the the real one for the fake and smashes it and then Khan is just like oh no so once again there's the joke reveal of oh well yes those men can be trusted they're dead now uh so yes working for Kamal Khan not a not a good uh, business idea for either uh I don't really think he has a 401k plan and he must keep up appearances. He goes out. He sees Orlov off, acting like everything's fine. And then as soon as the helicopter's out of range, turns to Gobinda, looks at the bug, get Bond, because now he knows he's escaped. And, of course, he thinks that Bond has overheard the entire conversation, when, of course, we know Bond only knows the location and the time of Karl Marx Stott in a week. And once again, we have no idea what that refers to. Once again, Magda looking on at the events, that slight smile. So once again, the idea that she's a spy in Khan's camp. We get the wonderful line, we'll track him, which of course sets up the idea of the manhunt, but uh, Khan is meaning, you know, he has the bug and things like that. So he'll be able to track him in the way that Bond has been tracking the villain's plot with the bug inside the Fabergé eggs. It's a nice bit of reversal and you can see how Khan is enjoying that. This brings us into the start of the jungle manhunt most dangerous game sequence, which once again is right out of classical adventure storytelling, but it's done really well because they're using real location footage and they're having real uh, events and Bond encounters, you know, tigers and elephants and snakes and leeches. So, you know, they're really going for it. There are one or two bits in this sequence in particular that, are on the silly side, you know, definitely have some of that Moonraker vibe where they went a little too far. I do love the bit here, though, where they go to cart out the bodies. Um, you would have to think, though, why wouldn't Bond just let them toss him down and not make the ghost-like noises? If they just thrown the bag down there, then he could have maybe just escaped later unnoticed. But 
Also, if you look, you see all the skeletons and bones there. You have to wonder how many times that Khan has had some people killed and they just toss the bodies to rot, like right outside the gates, and no one says anything. But we get a little bit of fun there upon doing that. Um, of course, you have to think, you know, he could have just stolen the Jeep, but maybe they didn't leave the keys in the ignition. Once again, you see the joy on Khan's face. Let the, sports com- let the sport commence. And he's like, okay, now you're in my element, Mr. Bond. So once again, this is right out of classical adventure storytelling. It is the most dangerous game, but instead of, uh, you know, Bond isn't just uh, hunted by the hunter. Now he's hunted by an entire force. <laughs> and he goes through many different hurdles. And, uh, you know, Roger handles it with aplomb, but it's much better when they're real hurdles and they're not played for laughs, uh, as the tiger will be in just a moment. It's amazing that, and uh, once again, a full-on John Glenn jump scare when we get the tiger jumping out, which uh, if you look closely, obviously when it goes outwards towards Roger, it's a prop, but then they perfectly cut it with real footage of a real tiger. So Bond goes around here, and then we get the actual tiger prop come out. And now we have the real tiger and Bond. Uh, Roger's idea was to use the uh, sitta, which came from uh, Barbara Wodehouse, the famous British dog trainer. It's it's a fun little joke. It's very goofy. Uh, but uh, obviously, most people today and most non-British audiences, audiences don't get the joke. But again, this sequence works because it's literally Roger running around in the jungle. It's you know, guys on elephants. And I, I have to say, it makes me flash back to the famous story of Harry Saltzman ordering all the elephant shoes during the production of The Man with the Golden Gun, thinking they would have an elephant stampede and that when elephants work in films, they have to have special shoes made. Um, so he ordered a bunch. So I've always felt that since they finally used elephants here, like maybe they finally were able to use some of Harry's elephant shoes that have been sitting around at Eon for all these years. Uh, I I gotta admit, I love Bond's line when the snake goes over him, which is very low in the mix. But when he says "hiss off," it's just, oh, that's that's one of that, that may be my favorite one-liner in the film. It's so brief, but it's just so beautifully done. Once again, Bond using his ingenuity instead of a gadget by being able to unhook Gobinda's binding. So when he fires the rifle, it knocks him off the elephant. And then Bond just barely escapes. Again, the bullet hits go off right behind him. So selling the idea of danger, Bond is really having to work for it. He's having to work for his survival, which is the only way to sell an action sequence. Again, if it's too easy and if it's played for too many laughs, there's no danger. And so the audience is not invested. So I think that is, of course, something key that, you know, everybody realized. So even though it's got this jauntier tone, it's definitely a a sequence with danger in it. This is where the sequence goes too far, though, when it's okay for Bond to swing from binds, but, you know, putting in the Tarzan yell, yes, it's definitely a bit much. Um, Of course, it is the original Johnny Weissmuller MGM Tarzan yell and was definitely available since this was the first MGM-produced Bond. You know, they could use that without having to pay for it. So it's a nod to that, just as the leech here, Bond having to get it off, makes you immediately think of the classic scenes in The African Queen, where Bogart gets covered in leeches in the water. But of course, with a jungle scene, you have to have leeches and crocodiles and and everything else. Of course, there is some set footage at Pinewood. It's really that little bit there with the water, uh, because of course, getting into the waters in the actual location, not the best of ideas. I do love the escape here where Bond finds the tourist boat and is able to escape on it, and thus they're not able to chase him onto it. Now, if you look very closely, one of the gentlemen that helps Bond get on the boat, the fellow with the camera and the glasses, is actually producer Michael G. Wilson and also co-screenwriter of the film. So this is his cameo for the film. He did a number of Hitchcock cameos, uh, starting really with Moonraker and then running through the film. So... There he is there with the camera and uh, glasses and, of course, his traditional beard. Once again, even though Bond has gotten away, we get beautiful one-liners. No matter with the economy tour, and Mr. Bond is a very rare breed indeed, soon to be made extinct. 
But again, Bond is just barely able to get away. So even though there were some laughs in there, there are one or two little bits that are a little too far. You know, he's barely able to escape with his life, so much so that <laughs> VJ very obligingly helps give him a rub down due to after, after that sequence. The mention of Octopussy's Island, you see VJ grinning. And when he says, you know, no men allowed on sexual discrimination i'll have to pay it a visit so there's a there's a nice charm and knowing quality between the agents which is really helpful and definitely helps the uh the allies of bond have more of a character and definitely sets up vj uh being one of the most uh deeply felt of the sacrificial lamb characters now i have to say a lot of people like to laugh or they think the crocodile sub infiltration vehicle is too goofy it's definitely you know, very much inspired by the rubber seagull we see in the Goldfinger pre-title. Once again, a Goldfinger reference, but I think it's absolutely inspired. Like I, that, it, it, For this sort of locale and having to have some sort of infiltration vehicle, it's absolutely brilliant. You could somehow see it being come up with for some sort of uh, spy infiltration stealth mission. It's it's an inspired idea, you know, a crocodile being the right dimensions and no one would want to go near it. So, yes, it's inherently funny that we see Roger's head and then the mouth closes. And, you know, it, yes, it's a fun gag, but I love the idea. I think it's an inspired bit of, uh, you know, uh, an inspired idea for a spy infiltration craft with natural disguise. So, of course, Bond has infiltrated Octopussy's lair. We think he's he thinks he's gone in unnoticed, but get a nice reveal of hidden security cameras. So Octopussy is able to see Bond enter and then have the great lines when he enters, you know, good evening. Now we get the reveal, and it's Maud Adams who returns to the series, uh, being the first actress to play in two Bond films. Previously, she appeared with Roger and The Man with the Golden Gun, and they really do have great chemistry on screen. They, of course, became friends during the making of Golden Gun in 1974, and it was wise of the casting directors and everybody to get someone who was who was a bit older a bit more mature to be able to be at roger's level and not have that uh insinuation of the the larger age gap and they play off of each other really well i will say that i think you definitely feel the romantic and the relationship qualities with bond and octopusy more than you do uh, bond and melina which is one thing in four your eyes only i think uh is is not as fully realized as it could have been, or maybe it was intended in the script. Uh, but I do think that that also had to deal with, you know, Melina and that film was a character obsessed with revenge. And so the, the romance was much more on the back burner. Whereas here, I think it's much more fleshed out and deeply felt, but just as with the property of, the, of a property of a lady short story and how they worked that into the film. Now we have the title octopusy, the of the taken from the title of the short story, the same name, how it's woven into the film is they made Octopussy an actual character and made her the daughter of the uh, Major Dexter Smythe character that uh, Bond was sent after in the original short story. And the idea that he had a daughter and this daughter all these years wanted to meet Bond for and, and thank him for giving her father the honorable alternative to the court martial he faced for stealing the Chinese gold and uh, killing his guide, Hans Oberhauser, which of course was the uh, one of Bond's father figures in, in his younger years, which meant that Bond had a certain uh, bit of feeling of revenge in the short story. But here, I love how they wove that into the film and gave Octopussy a reason for knowing Bond that wasn't just pure coincidence. Yes, it's coincidence that they've how somehow met, but it, it feels very much ingrained into the, into the story, and it's not the, you know just completely out of left field. Khan coming in and Bond revealing himself as the old friend of the family. It's a nice line, but it's a nice bit of back and forth. Bond has turned the tables on Khan once again, and in that reaction shot, we can see how Khan has now made up his mind. Okay, I'm going to get him anyway. <laughs> Another nice looming shot of the octopus. All of those set up the great moment later on during uh, the assault on the island when we get the best death in the film when the guy gets the, uh, <laughs> the octopus on the face. 
again, you can see Peter Lamont's production design, particularly here in Octopussy's Palace, and especially her bedchamber with that amazing bed, really beautifully done and fits the locale perfectly. And again, I think Alan Hume really accentuates the color very well and never never overdoing it. But there's always these these nice oranges and the the sort of creamy qualities of the of the walls that the sets really always come out. And of course, all of Octopussy's uh, army, for lack of a better term, have those very brilliantly red jumpsuits, which also immediately jump out visually. And then we immediately go to this very dingy place where Khan is going to hire all of the goons. And we see the first appearance of the iconic Yo-Yo Man. Uh, the Yo-Yo actually did work. The production came up with literally the working buzzsaw type Yo-Yo. And it really did, you know, cut through things. So uh, it's, it's really amazing that they took this idea and literally made the working model and used it throughout the film to such great effect and every time it's used the 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 actor they have his face is so menacing and then the sound of the yo-yo they created is just so vivid in the mix every time that it it makes it so impactful so it's one of those things you really remember from the film and you know definitely feels like you know if if bond went to india of course he would be fighting a guy with a, a yo-yo weapon like it just it, it totally makes sense you know uh, same thing making sense the the exchange that q will have with vj later on you know um he heard from bond 007 on an island exclusively populated by women we won't be hearing from him until dawn this is another nice little scene it's definitely very expository but the bit of bond and octopussy walking around through this beautiful location very much otherworldly, but she's explaining her back history and how she is a self-made woman and sort of fell into smuggling, but also how she revived the octopus cult and found all of these lost girls who were looking for spiritual enlightenment throughout the, the Far East. And as she says, gave them a purpose and, and built into legitimate business. You know, it, it really gives her character a, a scale, and uh, it's it's something that we don't often get in Bond films that's really, really important. Uh, it helps if the Bond women and the side characters and the allies have not just personality, but have actual lives and are actually doing things and have a, have a sense of a past, so that way they're, they feel much more like real people. Once again, Bond using actual detective skills and spycraft. And, of course, when Octopussy said she had diversed into also including circuses. And now Bond finds the circus flyer with the listing for the next stop being in Karl Marx Stadt. Now those are more pieces of the puzzle. Knowing that 009 died disguised as a clown. Knowing that he has to go to Karl Marx Stadt in one week. Seeing Octopussy run circuses and the circus will next go to Karl Marx Stadt in about a week's time. More pieces of the puzzle right there. Now, there is the usage of the two-of-a-kind idea, which, of course, is referencing the all-time high song lyric. So getting back to the central idea of even how the theme song is worked into the film, not just in uh, John Barry's theme, but also in it's worked into the actual dialogue, which is just a brilliant little touch. Now, this is one of the scenes that is never discussed. It's one of the most dramatic and romantic scenes in the entire series, but... When, you know, Bond rejects Octopussy's advances, but then goes after her and then does acknowledge that the two of a kind. If you look at the way that Roger plays this, and Maude as well, but when he turns her around and then they she breaks the embrace and then he says, you're right, we are two of a kind. The way that Roger sells that and the way that John Barry's music rises up and then they fall onto this absolutely gobsmacking Peter Lamont designed octopus bed with the silk sheets and pillows. I mean, it's just incredible. And it's a really dramatic moment that is right out of a romantic drama. And it's in the middle of a Bond film. That's the key moment that sells. There's something more serious to the Bond octopusy dynamic. And once again, I think is a distinct improvement on uh, the preceding film, which needed maybe a little bit more of that. 
Uh, and once again, it really helps that they got somebody who could really um, make that a nice two-handed scene with Roger, you know, with each one really participating fully. Now, unfortunately, poor VJ is going to meet his maker here. Uh, and once again, because VJ is such a likable presence and has really, you know, helped Bond in many instances and has joked around and things, his death is really impactful. And of course, he gets killed, of course, <laughs> by the iconic yo yo. And of course, because it's done off screen, we get just go into with the quick nod, immediately cut to the birds flying off. It's, you know, very classical and always much more impactful when moments of violence are not shown. I've always loved how Bond hooks his watch on the actual tentacle of the octopus headboard. It's a very minor thing, but it just, it, it's little things like that that when you do notice them, it feels so lived in. You know, of course, Bond would need to have his watch close at hand, and there's no nightstand, so of course he hooks it on the tentacle of the, of the octopus headboard. And I love that... He gets up, he puts his clothes on, and goes over to look out the window just because, as he says in the dialogue, just because he has a feeling. And, of course, now we see the nighttime uh, raid begin as they climb out of the water, and they look very ominous, climbing into the dark. And, of course, we see the slight glimpse of one of them on the balcony just behind Bond, which you might miss. But because we see that, and then the camera comes up on the curtain... It's a bit of suspense because we think it's, of course, one of the attackers. And, of course, it's revealed to be Octopussy. So it's a nice little suspenseful buildup. And once again, showing Bond having to use his powers of observation. And something is telling him that, obviously, something's up, even though it's just a feeling. And then I love that it's the droplet of water from the wet yo-yo that alerts Bond. We get that nice extra bit of suspense where the music drops down really low. John Barry underscores it just barely. And then as soon as the water droplet falls on Bond's face, it really ramps up. This is a really well-staged fight with a lot of nice meaty punches on the soundtrack. We get a lot of classic little bits. Bond almost gets strangled and does an actual wall run up. And Octopussy smashes a bottle over his head. So it's uh, nice to see Octopussy participating as well. And they're still having to deal with Mr. Yo-Yo Man on the, <laughs> on the upper balcony. And this is sort of John Barry's action theme for the film. The, the sort of repetitive bursts that come through. And it's really nicely done. And now we get the great death scene where Bond smashes the man's face into the aquarium and he gets the octopus on his face. We get those wonderful little sucking sound effects as he's screaming, but it's muffled screaming through the octopus. And also, I have to say the fact that Yo-Yo Man is covered in feathers from the bed that he cut open is just great. And we see the octopus actually moving <laughs> on the guy's face. It's just beautifully done. Now, this is a wonderful moment that rarely gets discussed. Here, Bond and Yo-Yo Man go out the window, and they're fighting. And then we see the crocodile come in, and we hear the scream. So the audience and Octopussy and everyone is left to think that Bond has died, defending Octopussy and everyone via crocodile. And you see how genuinely sad Octopussy is. And it's, it's, a, it's a very sad little moment. But it's very interesting because, of course, the crocodile is ostensibly the Q crocodile submersible. I guess Q sent it over. And Bond allows Octopussy and everyone to think that he's dead. So now he can go off and follow the trail. So it's a very cold moment because, of course, he's developed this relationship with Octopussy. But as Bond would, he, would ha he operates alone. So he allows... Uh, the woman he just spent the night with and developed a relationship with to think that he's dead and now he's going to go off and follow the trail to Karl Machstadt. And then we get this wonderful moment here as we, as is, you know, classic spy drama material where we come across the, the killed ally. And I love the fact that Roger, you know, looks at him 
and then sort of closes his eyes and has and just beautifully sells it when he says no more no more problems and then he's soaked to the bone and has the line you know you better signal them i have to go to a circus and karl marx start it's always great to see him out of the office so we get a nice it's obviously exposition uh here in the back seat of the car but it is British intelligence trying to figure out how General Orloff is tiled to Kamal Khan with him having the line, you know, why would General Orloff be interested in a smuggling, jewelry smuggling? But we immediately see again to M is giving Bond his identity and because this is setting up Bond going over into East Germany. So we are in full on Cold War territory here. This is where the tone of the film gets much more serious because it is Bond literally going over the border, over the Berlin Wall, as we get on the classical sign, you know, you are now leaving the American sector, and M says, you're on your own. And I love the way that Roger plays that last line. Oh, thank you, sir. It's a great comfort. Almost with a slight eye roll. But again, every time you see that you are leaving the American sector in Berlin, every time you see that sign in any sort of spy story, it immediately brings so many connotations and it's, of course, really interesting that we're in a serious spy story now, and we immediately are at a circus, which is, you know, the most, it's like the greatest example of childlike wonder, and we've got kids all over the place. So it seems like the absolute last place where you would have a spy story, which, you know, is actually a rather brilliant cover for, you know, what is ostensibly a jewelry smuggling caper. Who would think to look for anything nefarious inside of a circus? That just so happens to always stop at military bases. But, you know, a lot of circuses still do stop at military bases. So everything does make sense, even though it does seem kind of bizarre. Why would Bond go to a circus? It's all sold. You know, it's all tied into the plot. Another little thing, if you look closely at all the balloons around, I'd never noticed for the longest time they actually have the octopus logo on them. So <laughs> they even made custom balloons, which I found a, just a wonderful touch. And we get really well done bits of the uh, knife throwing act. And it's done for real, but they used a lot of old school trickery and did most of it in reverse. That's how they were able to do the, uh, you know, a blindfolded knife thrower. And then here, once again, they do the same thing, but uh, it works perfectly, it looks amazing, especially when he catches it barehanded, blindfolded. Magda looking wonderful in her sort of diamond-studded ringmaster's outfit. And a nice little bit of suspense because, of course, Bond can't be spotted. It will wreck his plans, seeing as everyone thinks he is dead. And, yes, it is a bit of a silly gag here where Bond uses the uh, rather large gentleman to <laughs> make his escape. But, you know, you have to use the tools that are at hand. So it, it does make sense in that, in that instance. And once again... Bond is having to use his wits. He goes towards the back exit, sees Gobinda. And I love the gag that the Russian soldier is yelling at him. Hey, you're blocking the show. I want to see this. <laughs> and also, if you, um, for fans, the man playing the guy who actually gets shot of the cannon is a legendary stuntman, Dickie Graydon, who had been in many Bond films. Uh, doubling for uh, Bond actors for many, many years, going back uh, all the way through the series. So he gets a nice little part there. And also this scene is very important because you may think, well, why did we need to see all of the circus ring? Well, later on, if you think about it, when we have the sequence with the bomb and we see the circus set up again, because we've seen how the show works and we know that it ends with the canon and we see how everyone is interacted, we've seen how the normal show is supposed to go. So since Bond has seen that along with us, we're able, to, Bond is then able to interact and figure out how to get in and know where the canon is going to be and figure out how the circus is run because he's seen it before. So while that scene may seem a bit you know, like you didn't exactly need it. You actually really do because it shows you the entire circus ring and, and how the whole circus is set up and staged. So then Bond can infiltrate it later on. And also we see where the bomb is going to go uh, because once we see that bomb and because we've already seen how the circus is run, we know exactly how it's going to be pulled off. 
I always love how fussy Lincoln is, and <laughs> he must have severe anxiety, especially here when it's discovered in about like a nanosecond that the jewelry is a fake. So you have to wonder just how exacting uh, Kamal Khan's uh, jewelry replication team was, because of course here the fake is spotted in like not even 10 seconds, and then of course Levy crushes it with his foot. And then this beautiful match cut from the crushed Romanov star to the real one where Octopus is examining it under a similar jewelry glass. And Orlov is like, the Romanov star. Now, of course, Bond using, uh, you know, a worker's jacket to infiltrate, you know, some part of the villain's organization is, you know, a classic Bond moment, classical adventure storytelling. But this is a very hands-on version because, of course, all he did was steal a jacket. Now he's crawling around under a train. But anytime you have a train in a film, you immediately get all the great romantic notions of trains and stories and films. And we get some really fantastic stunt work throughout this entire sequence that starts here when they start to move the train and uh, Roger as Bond will have to hoist himself up underneath the train as it's moving. And what's really amazing is they built this little platform and Roger is actually doing a lot of it himself. So you see that there, he puts his legs up and he's literally under the train car as it's moving. So it really sells the sequence when you have your star actually under there while the train car starts moving. So all of these shots, you know, that's really Roger underneath the train. And they did build this platform, but it was Roger and a cameraman and John Glenn crammed in there. But I mean, they really did it. And that sells this sequence so much. Now we go into this dark tunnel, which, you know, train going into a tunnel, classic image, also very ominous, but we see this identical train car. So automatically know something is going up, something is going on. This is the point at which the entire tone of the film hinges and changes. And it's with this one shot right here where it reveals the bomb and the John Barry Q comes on that is extraordinarily ominous. And as soon as we, the audience, see this and Bond sees this bomb being laid in an identical train car, the seriousness has just skyrocketed because now it's a nuclear threat. And the line, the effects are indistinguishable from the American bomb of the same type, you know. We know now something is up and we know that it's going to be disguised but, you know, the fact that now Bond is dealing with a nuclear bomb instead of just jewelry smuggling. Again, in the classical Goldfinger style, we go from the seemingly mundane uh, plot that Bond is involved in, whether it be gold smuggling or jewelry smuggling, into a plot of, you know, global consequences. Because, of course, it's just one bomb, but the idea is that it will push everyone to disarm nuclear weapons and the Bond says later leaving uh you know borders for orlov to just cross with his armies and you know potentially start world war three right then and there simply because he's bloodthirsty and wants he wants to you know take over the world but then it also it go the suspense gets into the photography here bond is hidden away it's all dark we get the l nice lighting from only the train lamps and this nice first-person perspective shot of the, the Russian bomb expert walking off, obviously right in front of Bond. And so now he's got to find some way of infiltrating the train car, stopping the bomb. This is really where the ticking clock starts. The, the, the timer hasn't been set yet, but again, the entire film changes as soon as that shot reveals the bomb. Now the entire score has changed. Again, John Barry has come up with this. It's on the soundtrack. It's called the Chase Bomb theme, but it really is extraordinarily ominous. But once again, this makes the film deadly serious. And while it still retains that element of adventure style, now we are in a full-blown Cold War thriller. And it's really amazing from just a, a structure standpoint, from a screenwriting standpoint, how beautifully integrated these two different films are 
And it all hinges on that one shot of that bomb being revealed. Because as soon as you see that, the stakes have been so raised that even the way Bond proceeds to the rest of the film, he's immediately more cautious and more serious. And now he's driven on. And the beautiful reveal of, you know, the figure reflected in the Romanov star and then turning around with the blowtorch. The knife throwing, referencing the killing of 009, making us think to that. Again, Bond is really having to use what's at his disposal. So he uses the cannon to crush the skull. And then I love how Bond immediately assumes the position, takes his clothes, and of course, nobody looks very closely at the face. Um, I always have the hardest time remembering, because of course the twins are named Mishka and Grishka, but I always have the hardest time remembering which is which. So that's why I always frequently find myself saying the twins. Now this leads up to one of my absolute favorite moments in Roger's entire tenure, when he gets to confront Orloff, uh, when Orloff is not expecting it, and he thinks his plan is going to go through, uh, you know, his plan is foolproof. And nobody has, you know, yet realized Bond has infiltrated the Octopussy gang. And Orloff gets on, and they stretch it out to the longest bit. But, of course, don't notice the Romanov star is missing in the jewelry. I guess they assumed it just settled in the jewelry. Orloff doesn't, you know, check all of it. But this moment here where Orloff gets on the train, and we have this absolutely wonderful interplay between Roger and Stephen Burkhoff. Again, you can see uh, Roger as Bond using the P5. This is the sequence where you really see it, and you can tell it's not the PPK. But the way that Roger holds the gun, the way that his eyes are dead cold with that steely glare and the intonations in his voice, uh, particularly the way that his, his eyes are basically staring holes through the screen in the close-ups, just contrasts beautifully with the way that Burkhoff uses the lines, you know, against whom? And you can see it unfold in Bond's mind, the, the sheer grandosity and the absolute evil, the, the full impact of what Orloff is planning to do, that he's going to explode this warhead on a U.S. base, and everyone will thus assume incorrectly that it was an American bomb that went off accidentally. Again, you can just feel the steeliness of, of Roger's performance here. This is one of his best moments in the entire series. And you can see Burkhoff starting to ramp up his Orloff. But the key line is when Roger says as Bond, the last line, on your feet, General, you're going to stop that train. But then the whistle goes off. Bond's plan is thwarted. But he gets one beautiful shot off where he gives the one guard a perfect third eye. <laughs> the expression of the guard is so priceless. And I love the fact that Orloff runs off just screaming, kill him, kill him, kill him. <laughs> and now Bond has to deal with an entire, uh, you know, bit of the Russian army. And now by hearing the train whistle, he knows the train is pulling out, and now he has to catch up to the train and somehow stop it. And of course, the, the, the fun gags of this sequence are the fact that Orloff becomes increasingly manic. He's trying to cut off Bond. Bond is heading for the train. Everybody's headed for the train. But Bond is still dressed as... The circus knife thrower has stolen Orloff's car that also has the the jewelry in the trunk. So now Orloff has also lost the all-important jewelry. Bond just got it by accident, doesn't even know it's there. And we get to have a little bit of fun with this sequence where you have the repeat of Bond driving a car on two wheels. Now we get to blow up the tires, which gets us to John Glenn's favorite image of the car going onto the train tracks. And of course... It's quite improbable that Bond would land exactly on the train tracks and the car tires rims would fit the train tracks, but it's perfectly executed. And as soon as we cut to the long shots, that's when John Barry knows to come right in with the James Bond theme. Once again, playing it for all it's worth 
and letting the audience really enjoy the moment. This is just enough of the fantasy and just enough of the bizarre, but it's such a wonderful classical image that it works. And once again, John Barry knows exactly when to pull the James Bond theme in and just how to style it to make the sequence work. And of course, we have a mixture of uh, set process footage with Roger and real set footage with the real car on the train tracks, which is how you sell any of these sequences. And when Bond has to make the transfer from car to train, this is the first glimpse of the really amazing train stunts that we see through the rest of this sequence. I always love how far the car shoots off, that they achieve that brilliantly. And of course, it crashes right into that boat, almost hitting the poor guy. And since we're in the modern CG era, this entire sequence takes on so much more impact now because, of course, this is literally a stuntman hanging on a real train. And it must be said that, uh, unfortunately, poor Martin Grace, who was the lead stuntman on this film, uh, was very nearly killed shooting this sequence when uh, the driver of the train overshot the... um, the portion of the track they were using. And so uh, he overshot it and drove too far and got to a point where there were obstacles. So Martin Grace was very badly injured, but uh, thankfully survived um, um, and was able to recuperate and come back on later films. But that pretty much took him out of the entire filming. But it just goes to show you, you know, uh, even when things are worked out, things can still go horribly wrong. So it's amazing that uh, he was able to, you know, survive without, uh, you know, catastrophic injuries in that sequence. I love the inherent humor of Gogol tracking down Orloff, and then they find the car, and then the soldier says, we found this as well, and it's all the jewelry inside. And then once again, Orloff is getting increasingly manic, almost... Uh, since it's all these cutaways to him in the car and he's just screaming in the background and we can't hear what he's saying, it always makes me think a bit of how Sheriff J.W. Pepper gets increasingly, uh, you know, like manic and live and let die as the boat chase goes on. And it allows Stephen Burkhoff to just ramp up his Orloff craziness, which is just, I, I can't get enough of it. Uh, I, while I, I do like the dual villain scenario, I just, it's its such a shame that Orloff gets killed off when he does, because, you know, the film does lose a bit of energy, and I love Orloff as the villain. Uh, this The dual villain technique is something they're, they're going to return to again, and I, I can't help but feel that uh, Maybaum and Wilson sort of took some inspiration from their uh, setup here when they were writing The Living Daylights, because there you once again have a... Uh, Soviet official working with another entity in their own scheme. So uh, I, I've always felt that maybe there was a sort of um, a bit of octopusy in uh, the Koskoff Whitaker setup of the Living Daylights a few years down the road. I will say though, this is a nice way to end Orloff's character and give him a nice fitting demise that he gets killed by you know their own border guards and it's like you know yes Orlov is having to run from Gogol and he's having to run to get to the train but you would think that he would know they would shoot him in the back but it's wonderfully dramatic and then Gogol runs up and you know Burkhoff just sells it for everything it's worth and he's crawling along the tracks and the blood's coming out of his mouth And I love that Walter Gotell gets to get the final word, you know, common thief. But again, just Burkhoff just does it to the hilt and sells this death scene. It's so wonderful. And then we get the nice bit here where Gotell or Gogol has to think about what Orloff was doing and he turns and looks and we see the train go through the last point. We see the gates close. So now it's made it past the border, which is the last place it could be stopped. So now it's literally up to bond because they've made it through the border. Now this is the point at which we get this, the actual setting of the ticking clock. Again, I would say that the tension ramps up as soon as we see the bomb, Uh, uh, Yes, it is really goofy that Bond is in a gorilla suit and actually does look at his watch, but it is intrinsic to the scene because Bond is having to make sure he has the right time, and he just does it so briefly, so he hopes he's not seen. So 
it is it, it is okay, but it is you know definitely a little on the goofy side that Bond is disguised in a gorilla suit. But of course, he is spotted in just a moment. And then once again, as soon as Gobinda turns the lever and we see the clock start, John Barry's cue comes right in. And I love the line, I take it none of you will be late. <laughs> it's just so wonderfully oily in all the right classical villainous ways. But once again, we see Bond is not dealing with idiots. We see Gobinda notice something is off. Bond makes a noise. Gobinda knows something's up. But of course, the time at which it takes Bond to get out of a gorilla suit would probably take much longer than what's indicated here. Gobinda just turns around and chops at it with a sword. But once again, in a wonderful bit of direction, John Glenn accentuates the suspense, drags it out to where Gobinda chopping off the head reveals Bond going out of the roof hatch. So very classically done. Um... Of course, we're going to get much more Hitchcockian style uh, touches in the rest of the sequence to come, which is, of course, Bond trying to stop the bomb before the ticking clock ends and the bomb goes off. So there are a number of Hitchcockian elements throughout the film. And, of course, you have a train and Hitchcockian elements. You automatically think of films like North by Northwest. But it's, it's particularly this section of the film where Bond is continually thwarted and the inherent humor uh, of the things that are typical that would happen to delay you from getting to a place. But it's, of course, also extraordinarily suspenseful because we, like Bond, know that he's racing to stop a nuclear bomb from going off and potentially starting World War III. Now, once again, the sound design is really key here. Here is the moment during the train sequence where they really fully up the engine effects and the, the overgrowth going by. The, the way they, they mix in the shoes, graping, uh, grazing all of the stones on the ground, again, the steam, the hiss, the train whistle, it really sells itself. And this is a really well-mixed film for 1983. Uh, it is a very wonderful-sounding Dolby stereo track, and it's moments like this that really do sell it. I love the idea that Octopus is getting a massage and Bond just knocks on the window and that just happens to be the time Kamala wa- walks in and just starts shooting. And Octopus is like, what's going on? I-, I don't know who he was. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Finish your massage. Again, it's it's a moving train with guys really running on top of it that just you don't see th- sequences like this anymore. And of course, once again, it is mixing on-set footage with the principal actors, but it is perfectly edited together, and it's really amazing what they do with the sword here, you know, actually generating sparks and using the steam hose of the train and using real practical effects. You know, again, even simple things like that you don't see anymore, and it's little little things like that, little old-fashioned techniques that are used throughout the film that help contribute to the old-fashioned adventure film flavor, but also there there's te- techniques that have never been really improved on, and we've really lost that uh, classical way of telling stories, and those techniques have never been improved upon, and, you know, even a scene like here, when we go in the tunnel, we have Bond and Gobinda, they just fill it with smoke and they have the lights passing by. And that really sells that idea. We're going in a tunnel without having to build an actual tunnel. And I love that Grishka comes out, thinks it's his brother for a second. And then when Bond turns around, he gets all serious and pulls the knife. And of course now Bond is off the train and now has to play catch the bomb for the rest of the sequence. But it does allow to finish off what we started with the killing of 009 in a very similar fashion. So it's mirroring that scene, and Bond is himself almost killed by knife. But we get a wonderful reversal where he says, this for my brother. He's going to get revenge. But Bond is just able to get the drop on him, wedge the knife out, and gets the wonderful, and that's for 009. And once again, little moment, but you can really see the passion in Roger's performance there, even though he's immediately got to run off and he's under the gun because he has the ticking time clock to deal with. But 
always a nice, always, there's always a moment for getting that revenge and the, the henchman get his, getting his comeuppance. And once again, I've always loved that they mirror the opening killing of 009 because we have the two figures in the knife thrower outfits and Bond is running for his life inside of a wooded area. So it is literally mirroring the opening uh, 009 sequence. Now, this is the bit of pure Hitchcockian uh, work here, where Bond is now forced to hitchhike and try to get to the base as fast as possible, stranded on the side of the road, and so he has to just start running down the road, and it becomes one event after another that prevents him from first getting to a phone, then being able to contact MI6, to or then contact the airbase, and then he finally has to give up and try and just get there in person before the timer runs out. And Hitchcock loved doing things like that to enhance the suspense, which makes the audience sit there screaming. You know, it's like the the way to build suspense is you set your plan, you set your problem up, and then you continually frustrate the character trying to, uh, you know, achieve a goal, which we have here with the teenagers who strand Bond and then Bond literally just throws them off and then has to keep running, which is something that would happen to somebody trying to hitchhike. And that was actually something John Glenn talked about that happened to him uh, many times uh, in, in his earlier years. So he, he insisted that had to be in there and it works beautifully. The the humorous bits like that, they're, they're never too much and they always play into the suspenseful buildup of this sequence, which really is the single purest Hitchcockian style sequence of the entire series and really plays the the suspense up for everything it's worth. Although it is maybe a bit much that Bond does get, you know, one one couple to pick him up. And of course, they're very German and they're eating bratwurst and they have beer and they're driving a Volkswagen Beetle. Like, yes, that's a bit on the nose, but, you know, okay lovely gag here where Gobinda freaks out when the when the boulder hits the can <laughs> with the bomb in it. Here is the next Hitchcockian bit where Bond is able to get to the phone, but he's cut off by the lady who wants to talk a long time, who won't listen to any any of Bond's pleading. And once again, because we've seen the, cir- the circus earlier on, now we see it starting. We know the show is starting. We see Kamal look at his watch. The clock is ticking down. And we know as soon as the circus gets to the end with the cannon sequence, we know that's when the bomb's going to go off. Love the way that Roger narrows his eyes when he realizes he can't get to the phone. He sees the woman's left her car, and it's an Alfa Romeo. And so Bond gets to roar off. And this really sets up a wonderful chase sequence. No one mentions it, but this is really one of the best staged car chase sequences in the entire Bond series. Once again, handled by the great Remy Julian and his legendary stunt team. But of course, being in Germany, they really uh, were able to utilize the famous Autobahn, where of course there is no speed limit. And you know, it's Bond behind the real behind the wheel of a really great Alfa Romeo and able to just floor it. So there are these great moments of him fishtailing around curves, and it really ser- serves to sell the desperation of the sequence. So, of course, it wouldn't be anywhere near as dramatic if Bond had just been able to call on the phone and say, hey, there's a bomb at the airbase, go defuse it. Uh, it's inside the cannon. No, he's got to go there in person, and now he's got the police chasing him for something as ostensibly simple as a stolen car. Now, I'm sure this this was cooked up on the set. I don't know if it was in the script, but the bit here of the car not, car not starting is classical suspense. It's right out of Double Indemnity, of course, uh, where uh, they're, they're unable to start the car after the killing, which would, of course, ruin their plan. So it's a, it's a fun little moment where Khan and Gobinda aren't able to start the Mercedes. Once again, getting to use the Audubon in a chase. I'm amazed... It's been done so infrequently in films. It just seems tailor-made for it, being able to just floor cars in a chase down the Autobahn. But you get that great sense of movement that really only comes from Remy Julian car car sequences. And it really helps to just sell Bond's desperation because he's got to get there. There is no time. And he's, of course, the only one who knows that there's a bomb in there. And it's also wonderfully suspenseful that we see all of the base personnel so entranced by the show for children. And then Conigo being to get the spot. That was Bond. Let him go. He'll be late 
we'll be rid of him too. It's 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 just a wonderful bit that they literally pass Bond on the way to the base, and Cotton's just like, oh well, he won't make it in time. Let's go. We don't have time to worry about it. You know? Once again, I, I just find it charming that the base commander is acting like a ten year old boy. You know. The circus brings out the the child and even the base commander, who is then too blind to see what's going on at first when Bond does appear and tries to convince them, even though he's dressed as a clown, which makes him very much uh, not to be believed. Again, nice roaring turn there into the base. And I love how Bond does try to enter normally at first, and of course is completely unbelieved. <laughs> it's not believed at all. I do like how the police are able to just go in as well, and, and all the base police are like, um, so yeah, we got a stolen car chase going on here. Uh, oh well, that's just going to go on on the, the you know back road. Of course, it has to be wondered why Bond doesn't just run directly into the circus, since there is a ticking clock and just try to explain, but of course there's so many personnel and there's no time to explain that he would need some sort of disguise. Uh, but again, the idea of there being, you know, only five minutes left on the clock and then he makes himself as a, uh, makes himself up as a perfect clown. It's like, well, how long did that take? But, you know, dramatic license is what it is. A lot of people like to complain about Bond being disguised as a clown. Some people use it as a way to make a dig at the film and their perceived notion of, of Roger's, you know, lighter touch at times, which is really unfair because... It is a perfect means of infiltrating the circus, and, you know, I mean, he could have grabbed a, a service jacket like before, but he's been recognized and would be stopped by the base personnel, so we would have to have a facial disguise. So while, yes, it is a bit silly for Bond to be dressed up as a clown, it does make sense, and they do take the time to reveal him first, so the audience is like, okay, we get it, we can now see, okay, Bond's disguised as a clown, and it makes sense. But also, very fittingly, he's dressed the exact same as 009 was in the beginning. So it's another nice bit of mirroring. And we get the nice little bit of humor where <laughs> the clown comes out. So Bond comes out and gets laughed at as a clown. And another nice bit of subterfuge. Of course, there's another identically dressed clown who gets mistaken for Bond. But Bond does see the security coming in, and so he runs off fast allowing the other one to be captured as the potential car thief. Again, once again, you have to look at just the amount of desperation that Roger has built into his performance here. It gets overlooked, but he really sells this. And especially when he runs over and he rips off the wig and in full clown makeup, General, there's a bomb in that cannon. And, of course, he, the general immediately thinks that it's a bit. And now Bond has to reveal his own subterfuge to Octopussy, so his faking his own death rather coldly is now being brought to the fore immediately. But he's having to also reveal that she's been betrayed by Khan, and her entire jewelry smuggling scheme is going to be exposed as well. But Bond doesn't have time to wait. And then in charging on starts a whole fracas in the, in, the, in the center ring, which is a nice bit of drama where you have all of the circus people starting to fight all the guards. It's, it's a very striking image, and we'll get a little reprise of that in the final climax of the Monsoon Palace. But again, Bond is so desperate, he only can find a fire axe to try and chop the cannon open. And of course, fittingly, it's Octopussy who is the one to reveal the bomb because Bond has evoked a trust in her and it's her trust in Bond's trust in her in that, in that reciprocal trust that convinces her to fire the gun that reveals the bomb. And then if you look very close, you know, Bond has literally diffused it with no time at all to spare and gets and literally removes it and you see the pins come out and you hear the the timer stop and we get that nice silent moment you literally catch your breath 
We get the nice undercut of humor with Dickie Graydon popping out. We go now. I always do love how Octopussy just slips away. She's immediately consumed with her de desire to get revenge on Khan. And Magnus is like, oh, he just went back to India, I guess. Yeah. And then Bond is just getting a lot of handshakes looking around like, wait, where'd you go? What? <laughs> but now at least he's able to, you know, catch his breath. So, you know, that is the main ending of essentially the Cold War movie within the confines of Octopussy. So we get the final climax with the villain. And rather interestingly, from a structural standpoint, it is taking the place of the traditional tag ending of a Bond film where usually the henchman comes out and is like the last forgotten character Bond has forgotten about. Or, you know, the ending of Goldfinger where Goldfinger is inside the plane going towards the White House. But instead of having just a tag scene, we have a whole tag climax where we go back to India and we see Octopussy trying to infiltrate the Monsoon Palace, take out Khan herself, and then Bond becomes the sort of third party who intervenes in the middle of this battle with Q. So it's, it's a nice way to tie off the film and to have a nice action-adventure classical-style climax with a nice bit of inherent humor because we see, you know, Octopussy's female army acting together and being able to take out all the guards. And yes, it's, you know, definitely on the completely ridiculous side in elements and they're doing all these gymnastic routines and stuff, but they're shown to be very capable and they distract the outside guards and they infiltrate the palace and everything. So it's, it's just a... A wonderfully cooked up scene. Yes, it's it's you know a little bit silly, but it's it's amusingly so. It never becomes too cartoony or anything. So it still works, and it's just again, it's something you don't see every day, and that's that's just part of Octopussy's wonderful charm, really. That it, it can sell a scene like this, and and it works, and it's satisfying, and again, just something you don't see every day. And then after that, John Barry's Q comes in for the assault on the Monsoon Palace and is full-on serious classical adventure style uh, musicianship and really sells the entirety of the sequence. And what's also great is it starts out very stealthily and has a nice emotional qual quality here when Octopussy actually confronts Kamal and you know basically is like, you know, you betrayed me. And it's really wonderful to see how Louis Jordan plays the scene because at first, since he's at gunpoint, he's trying to win Octopussy back over. And it's also funny if you look at how Louis Jordan says Octopussy. It's it's like Sean Connery and Goldfinger, the way he says pussy. You know, Louis Jordan's having so much fun with the word, especially when he's like, Octopussy. And he's shaking his head, Octopussy. And he shows her the, the the plates for printing money. So he's obviously always got a backup plan and scheme. But again, I would never do anything to hurt you. It's just a wonderful bit of duplicity. Kamal Khan is evil to the last, and, and you love him for it. <laughs> Once again, Gobinda is not an idiot and spots the team outside through the window. Once again, I just love the way Louis Jadon shakes his head and just says, Octopussy. <laughs> And ostensibly, that's another money-making scheme Kamal had that he was not letting Octopussy in on. And, of course, recognizes that it would be useful to have her as a hostage, which is why they take her with him anyway. Now, John Barry's cue goes into full tilt, again, with the return of that action theme and has the James Bond theme built into it. Now we go right to the triangle-led jaunty James Bond theme. And of course, if they come in by a hot air balloon, of course it has to have the Union Jack on it. And it's also interesting, we see Q brought into the action for really the first time in the series. It's totally unnecessary, but it's just a beautiful flourish and sets up what we get with the expansion of Q in uh, you know the end of the decade in License to Kill. So... At this point, they were already trying to find a few ways to bring 
good old Desmond in and some other unexpected places to give us some great cue moments, of which he'll have one of his best at the end of this sequence. Again, I love the little dramatic ramps John Barry builds into this queue and times them, they're timed perfectly. Bond crashes through the window with one of the mooring ropes. Gets off another perfect shot on the guard. And then there's a fun gag here where we see the tiger rug and we can only assume it's the same tiger that Bond encountered in the manhut sequence. Then he uses that with the, we have the slight roar on the soundtrack to distract the guard. And this is setting up what is really the signature moment of the film, the most fantastical bit of adventure where Bond slides down the banister firing an AK-47, which is just sheer magic. Capped off with shooting the, the, the banister point. And then, of course, I love the fact that he's out of ammunition and has to run off anyway. But that's just always been, to me, the signature moment of the film and one of the most magical images in all of Bond. Again, James Bond theme, and we get the LCD watch finally coming into play. Q has shown Bond how they're escaping. And this little portion of the sequence where they're doing this daybreak escape, and this is, of course, shot day for night, but it's just beautiful the way they escape on horseback at the break of dawn, closely followed by Bond, and of course they're on they're on horses because of course you have to be. It's a classical adventure moment. But the Bond theme is going at full tilt. And now we get Q's uh, <laughs> great moment where he saves Octopussy's ladies and then gets thanked profusely. <laughs> Later perhaps. Now this here, when John Barry ramps up the theme and we see Bond on horseback going for the plane. And when John Barry adds in those massive hits of the gong, it really makes the sequence come to life. But the particular stunt here, the horse to plane transfer that happens is the single most impactful stunt in the entire film. It is astonishingly well pulled off and an unbelievably difficult thing to do because you have to train the horse. The horse was terrified of the airplane and it's ri ridiculously dangerous to do, but it shows Bond's determination to you know, stop Kamal Khan and it's just beautifully cut together, photographed, Rogers on horseback, just so exquisitely executed uh, you know, in terms of stuntmanship, direction, editing, and it so often gets overlooked because we immediately go into another fantastic aerial sequence with uh, the same uh, team of B.J. Wirth and Jake Lombard who originally did the Moonraker pre-title sequence and would come back, uh, you know, on Living Daylights and other Bond films. But it's just always that that particular stunt is the one that always sticks with me. But then we have this amazing work where... You know, they, they did build some handholds into the plane, but, you know, obviously Khan is throwing the plane around, and that's really Jake Lombard hanging on for dear life there. And, of course, you, you he has the hidden parachutes on and everything, but, you know, again, that is a real man risking his life on, you know, many attempts to get all the shots necessary. Again, just the right amount of process footage on stage, you know, it, and of course, John Glenn knows exactly how much he needs of Roger's reaction shots to use the minimal amount of stage work to make sure the sequence sells. And the amazing part is they bought this plane, they used it, and then actually flew it over to England and put it on the stage for all the actors to climb around. So that really sells the sequence even further, that it's the same plane. It's not a fake plane. And so they literally had to clear a nearby farm and land it and then bring it into the stage. And I love the moment where, uh, you know, Khan orders Gobinda to stop Bond and says, go out there and get him. Out there? Yes, excellent. And he clamps the knife between his teeth like Nick Knack does at the end of Man with the Golden Gun. But once again, you know, everybody likes to complain about process footage, but John Glenn being a longtime editor and second unit director, he knows exactly how much you need to sell the sequence. And Gobinda is so determined. You know, he gets out there. He really tries, but 
He's just unable to keep up with Bond's ingenuity. And once again, it's Bond using what's at his disposal and not a Q gadget to stop the villains. So now he's going to actually force the flaps of the tail down. Again, very simplistic, but, you know, what else can you do when you're hanging on the back of a plane in midair? And again, you, you have to commend Roger for really selling this. It's a very difficult thing to do, but, you know, he's bear, gritting his teeth and really bearing it. And they've got the wind going on the process stage. And Khan is so determined that Louis Jordan is really trying to sell it. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to make it anyway. And he's so, and all the little, the little grimaces he makes really helps sell the sequence. It's also a nice touch that both Bond and Akabusi are barely left hanging on. And the really interesting thing here with the explosion of the plane, they did try using a real emptied out, hollowed out plane of the same model. But uh, it, when they shot it, they put a dummy in the pilot seat, but it actually kept flying. So they had a, a dummy flying a plane for a while, which is a terrifying thought. But uh, unfortunately, sometimes things just go wrong. And I, I love Gogol's statement. He's sitting in M's office. Our government categorically denies the incident ever occurred. So this becomes yet again another top secret file inside the annals of various governments that the, the world is better off not knowing. And we get a wonderful tag ending for, you know, Bond is, you know, too injured to travel. And this gives Roger a graceful exit and of course, you know, Roger had been on a, a per film negotiating contract basis. So in a lot of ways, a lot of people now, you know, really do think this probably would have been a great send off for Roger. And this is a great way to end his Bond tenure. But I am really glad that he did stick around for A View to a Kill, which is a, a very underrated film as well, I, I do strongly believe. We get to end the film on a classic exclamation of James, which is a, a nice, knowing, audience-winking line. It's a, it's a nice, fun note to send everybody out on, out of the theater, and we go right back into the reprise of the title song. So Octopussy is a film that ultimately charms and wins over its audiences and does so in blending old-fashioned adventure, the exotic Indian locale, and a really taut, suspense, Cold War thriller core. So it's a really multi-layered, very multifaceted film, particularly in its story and its multi-villain scenario. And the way the plot is dealt out over time, and we're not given all the information, so we are in with Bond on this mystery, trying to fit the puzzle pieces together. So it definitely picks up where For Your Eyes Only left off and going back to Fleming material and using that as a springboard was once again the absolute correct right choice to base this film around. And the Fleming materials, The Property of a Lady and Octopussy are just beautifully woven into the film. They don't feel out of place and they are intricately put in the right places and tied in to the overall events and the new characters. So it's all intrinsically in place and nothing just sticks out like a sore thumb. So that is, that is something that the eighties films really need more credit for. Uh, and also for pulling various elements out of novels that had already been adapted, but you know, sequences and ideas that hadn't been used because by this point they were really having to grasp at straws. They, they never used any of the continuation novels for materials, but uh, they had already, you know, adapted all the primary Fleming novels. So uh, using what they had left and trying to always maintain the spirit of Fleming was the absolute genius master stroke and what makes the 80s films have a soul and a bond at their core throughout. So Octopussy is a film that often gets overlooked uh, usually gets brought up with the Battle of the Bonds idea with Never Say Never Again coming out the same year. But it's, it's an interesting, well-made, extraordinarily well-crafted film that really represents the one and only time James Bond on the screen. A James Bond film was a full-fledged boy's own type adventure, but also a Cold War thriller at the same time. It's a remarkable film when you look at all of its strengths, how well it's made. And also, it's just 
a wonderful, fully relaxed, well-crafted, enjoyable action-adventure thriller. It is the kind of film no one makes anymore. The, the whole notion of the action-adventure film as a genre is dead and buried in our modern CGI-led age. And that's a real shame, and it's, it's something that helps Octopussy become a, a, a really special film, simply because these kinds of films don't exist anymore, and you know, Bond as a series is really the last gasp of that. And they've really gotten away from the action adventure thriller, particularly in the, in the modern eras and uh, with, with, you know, so much other competition. I think they've really lost sight of what Bond was grounded in and the inspirations for Bond in the first place, because Fleming himself was greatly inspired by the adventure stories of his youth. And I think the idea of, Indiana Jones sort of playing a part and inspiring Bond to go off on this path and thinking of Octopussy in the terms of classic boys' own adventure storytelling uh, is absolutely spot on. That's that's what Octopussy is all about. It's having the the successful elements of For Your Eyes Only brought forth into the next film with the, the direct Fleming bass throughout, but finding ways to inject some more humor, to inject a feeling, a, a sense, a definite sense of uh, that old-fashioned throwback to classical adventure storytelling with cliffhanger serials and Rage of the Lost Ark being so successful and reinvigorating that idea in people's minds. And, you know, in a sort of way, you know, Four Years Only was doing that as well, getting back to classical spy storytelling in the From Russia With Love mold. And when you look at it really closely, because there's a Cold War thriller in the middle of Octopussy, you know, everything with Orlov's plot, that is a straight-up Cold War spy story. It's really amazing that that's hidden in there, you know, and it's worked in beautifully, and it's tied into everything, so you get both sides. So in a lot of ways, Octopussy is really a film that is sort of straddling the fence between the eternal uh, uh, seesaw act that the Bond films have done since the 1960s between the more serious Fleming directly inspired films uh, like For Musha With Love, the Terrence Young film style, for example. And on the other side, you have the more fantasy driven, the more gadget laden, the more high living fantasy films like Goldfinger and what is generally viewed as the more Guy Hamilton entertainment style. So when you really look at it, uh, I made several references to how you could make Goldfinger parallels, not just in nods, but also some of the plotting. But there are direct from Russia with love nods, and you have all the instances of spycraft. You do have exchanging recognition codes. You have Bond using his wits. You have the gadgets not working, which was something that happened right in For Your Eyes Only, which was a direct, we want to get away from the gadgetry. So... You have elements of both, and it's one of the few films that really does that. Uh, it happens a few more times throughout the 80s era, but it's interesting to see the series try and finally balance those two sides because every time a Bond film is made or even developed, it, it, it becomes a matter of, okay, are we doing a From Russia With Love or are we doing a Goldfinger? What, what sort of theme are we going for? Are we doing the more serious? Are we doing the more fantastic? Is this a... a a Fleming style story where everything is deadly serious or is this more the let's entertain everyone and have a fantastic two hours so Octopussy does actually manages to do both which is a really interesting conceit and something that very few films are ever able to pull off and because it's so effort effortlessly done and it's so enjoyable a film experience from start to finish and unlike really any other film in the series it, it doesn't get looked at critically or, or very seriously it just sort of slots in as bond number 13 the bond film of 1983 and roger moore's sixth film and it, you know it, it, it sort it definitely gets overlooked so i feel it is a film that you know absolutely as with all the original bond films rewards multiple repeat viewings uh, as these films have many elements that just reveal themselves over time and they become uh, the films themselves become you know definitely parts of your life and like cherished old friends that you get to revisit you know once or twice a year but uh, you know they they definitely 
have staying power. They have stood the test of time, which means they should be considered as great works of art, which they always have been. And that's something I've always felt about the Bond films, and I've always hated that they're never taken seriously, uh, you know, in the critical world, especially as great works, which they are. And so that was really my impetus for doing these commentaries in the first place, because I wanted to talk about the films that I love so dearly, uh, you know, in a serious, straightforward manner, but also in a, in a very conversational style. So hopefully, you know, when you listen to me babble on about Octopussy, it, I can hopefully enrich some of the viewing experience and... I really wanted to, you know, do readings into the plotting and the screenwriting and the and, and do character and scene analysis because they're so Im- that stuff is so important to how these films tick. Literally, you have to understand how these films work, and it, really, those lessons are things that have been lost o- over time because no one can equal Bond. And even with with the with the new films, they they find it increasingly difficult to maintain the same level of excellence with all the competition and also with, you know, for lack of a better term, none of the old guard around anymore for the most part. And people just don't make these kinds of films anymore. And once again, that just makes films like Octopussy so much more special in our our current era because they really are from a bygone era where films were well-crafted, well-put-together, and so effortlessly made that... They, they. It seems like it's easy. It seems like it's a, it's a film that always existed. Like it was always there, and it's just like, oh, I'm gonna watch Octopussy again, you know. Uh, and people don't look at them for how amazingly well put together they are. So even if people don't like certain films or they have their own preferences, you know, Bond films should be looked at more seriously than what pretty much everybody does. Uh, and just ranking favorites or comparing the actors you know no one ever talks about uh, the directors and the writers and the producers especially and the struggles they had particularly starting here once MGM really took over United Artists uh, and from this point onward it caused increasing headaches throughout the rest of the 80s and to the 90s and that issue is still with us today something the current producers Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli still have to deal with on a daily basis um, but I just, I, I really hope that if you've stuck with me through this entire commentary, I've been able to and maybe enrich your opinion of the film, and maybe the next time you sit down and watch it, you'll be able to, you know, think more deeply into various facets I may have mentioned. And once again, I'm just scratching the surface here. I have, I, when I finish one of these, I realize I've barely covered anything I, I wanted to because I have so many thoughts and ideas that are going through my head when I'm doing one of these. And it's very difficult to try and cover everything while also, uh, you know, doing live analysis of the various scenes and bits of character moments while they're going on on screen and not losing my place and things like that. So once again, uh, Octopussy is a film that's extraordinarily underrated and it just feels effortless. And I I really do think it sort of gets lost in um, with the rest of the films and and becomes overlooked and it's not examined for just how incredibly well put together it is. And it's, it's just plain fun. It's a fun adventure. It is a little bit of a romp if you want to term it that, but it's also got that central serious core of having that Cold War spy thriller with full-on Hitchcockian elements and really the best ticking clock of the entire series. And once again, Roger Moore really sells the entire performance in every single scene. And, you know, Bond lead actors really do have to carry the entire film because they're the focus of every single scene. So it's it's a lot of strain to put on an actor and, you know, they they will sort of tailor moments to the actual actor portraying the role in the screenwriting process, but it still is up to everyone involved to make sure the film is successful. And Octopussy managed to, manages to pull this off with aplomb and it really does work beautifully, and it, it just feels effortless. It feels like it's always been there, and 
I just think it's it's very special because it's it's really one of a kind in the series. It has that throwback adventure boy zone element it mixed in with a Cold War thriller, so it allows you to have the best of both worlds from both the From Russia With Love side of things and the Goldfinger side of things. And once again, it's really one of the only films that manages to do that, and it does it well, which is an extraordinarily difficult almost really impossible thing to do and when you really look at it seriously it's amazing they pulled it off and built off the success of the ideas they input in for your eyes only thus making the second film of the 1980s john glenn era be another fantastic success so if you've stuck with me through this entire commentary my absolute thanks it means the world to me for uh, to know that people listen to these tracks and you know enjoy them and and hopefully get something out of my babbling and you know I, I know most people admittedly don't view the Bond films as art but I, I genuinely do and I, I feel it's about time these films are viewed as the serious timeless works that they are and always have been so that, that was another that, that was the primary reason why I, I felt the need to start doing these commentary tracks and get some of my adoration out into, into the world. But uh, Octopussy is, is a really fantastic film that I, I just feel gets so overlooked. And I, I really appreciated the ability to uh, have the time to sit down and really talk about some of its really interesting structure and its great strengths inherent throughout and its place within the history of the Bond timeline and the series. So uh, once again, thank you so very much for listening. Uh, and I will return very shortly in my next commentary where I, the motion picture analyst, will return in my commentary for A View to a Kill. So once again, so very humbly yours, I am the motion picture analyst. <laughs>